Karma Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be the WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And what a treat we had today. He was the Florida heavyweight champion, the Georgia heavyweight champion, the AWA Southern heavyweight champion. He held more titles than I could possibly mention. Ran one of the most iconic territories in wrestling history. Also the owner of said territory. But all you need to know is one thing. He's the Tennessee stud. He is Mr. Ron Fuller. Ron, welcome to the show. Oh, man, great to be on with you guys, man. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to have some fun today. But me and Jerry, uh, Gerald, go back a long way. And, uh, and uh, you know, and it's great to meet you today. And uh, like I said, you had you got, uh, uh, I don't know if it's the privilege, I'd call it, to meet my brother. But uh, at least you had the opportunity to spend some time with Rob. And uh, it's, uh, it's just it's great. I appreciate the opportunity to be on with you guys. Well, Ron, Ron, we we sure appreciate you coming on and your your time. We know we know you're a very busy man. You 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 you're uh, a quite quite a business entrepreneur. You you've started several different businesses outside of the realm of professional wrestling, outside the comfort zone, and it was highly successful. And we want to discuss a lot of that. But you know, like you said, you and I go way back. You know, families and everything. Um, you know, when, when Briscoe's first got in the business, some of the first people we met were, were the Welches and the Fullers, you know, and like that. And I, I've been fortunate enough to be around your cousin, Jimmy Golden, and, and his dad. And, and of course, your your brother and I were, were terrorizing Georgia back in the early days back there. And, I, you know, I never could understand until later on why, why we get around a group of ladies and all the ladies would go to your brother because I was quite a bit better looking than your brother, but I guess he, he had something that I didn't have, but uh, a lot that I didn't have, I was say. But, uh, you know, now I know, now I know after, after, after witnessing him a few times. So it, it's surely a pleasure to be on here, but let's talk about the Tennessee stud. And you know what motivates the Tennessee stud and, and some of your, 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 your business ventures and, how you got into them, I find it really fascinating. I always respect guys that, that go outside, like John's a Wall Street uh, whiz. You know, he's got, he got a security license and practiced on Wall Street for several years. Been with Fox Business News. So he's stepped outside that comfort zone many, many times. And, you know, me, me being a, a businessman down here in Florida with a body shop and real estate uh, uh, deals and everything, I feel like the three of us have a lot in common and just the drive, knowing you and knowing John and everything. But let's get into it a little bit. The Tennessee stud, you know, came a little bit later. But tell us a little bit. I mean, your family goes back, correct me if I'm wrong, from 1924, almost 100 years your family's been in this business and created stars that are that are known globally and they all come from that little 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 patch of land up there in Tennessee. So tell us fill us in a little bit about your grandpa uh, or your great grandfather, how he started in the business and, and wrote on. I've read some stories. The great thing about this con, uh, uh, podcast John and I get to do we get to do research on 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 the guys we have on and we find out things that we never knew. But I found out that you know your 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 grandpa was trained by by the late great, uh, not the one that we know now that we all admire and respect, but the great late great Dutch Mantel. But kind of lead us into that going up to how he got into to professional wrestling and started this whole dynasty with the wealth full of family. Well, you know, uh, I come from basically the oldest and the largest wrestling family on the planet. Uh, my grandfather started a uh, hundred years ago. Uh, basically, I think he actually had his first match in 1924 in Columbus, Ohio, in one of the very first territories that was uh, available. And he got sent there by Dutch Mantel, who trained him. And uh, for uh, for people who don't know the original or anything about the original Dutch Mantel, there's a great story right there in that one individual. Uh, a granddad uh, trained with him. Uh, Dutch Mantel, uh, the very first workout, broke his arm on purpose, and uh, tried to, uh, you know, discourage him from coming back. And my granddad uh, told him, he says, when I get well, I'm going to be back. And uh, then he hook scissored him the next time they were, they wrestled together. Uh, and uh, and my granddad turned in his hook scissors, broke his ribs, and, uh, and actually was on top of him 
And a Dutch caught said, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. And my granddad uh, was huffing and puffing and had a broken rib. And uh, and he, he said, uh, he said, uh, did I hurt you? <laughs> you know, because a Dutch had a Dutch accent. And uh, Roy said, uh, yeah, I think you broke my ribs. And, uh, and he said, uh, he goes, uh, I, I like you, boy. He said, uh, you come back. He said, uh, I make a wrestler out of you. And uh, just one real quick story about how things were back in those days. This was, with, this was about 1920, probably four years he trained with Dutch Mantel. And so uh, uh, when, they got to, when he got to it pretty well uh, ready to send, uh, Dutch got ready to send him to Ohio, Dutch got an offer from, there were two Houston wrestling promoters back in those days. And the two promoters were battling to see who was going to run Houston. And so they sat down together and they made an agreement. They said, I'll tell you what we do. We, you get the best shooter you can get. I'll get the best shooter I can get. And whoever wins that match will split the gate. And then whoever wins the match wins Houston. And uh, so uh, one of those guys called Dutch Mantel. Dutch Mantel told Roy, he said, I got to offer, uh, I got to go to Houston. And uh, this was back when, the, you know, Model T's were pretty hard to come by, right. you know. Dutch was a wealthy guy, and I, if we got enough time, I'll tell you how he became wealthy, which is amazing. But he had a Model T. And uh, so he said, uh, we go to Houston. You watch my back. I need somebody to watch my back. So uh, they drove across Texas from Amarillo to Houston, uh, 1920. Early, that, early. That, that, that had to be a trip in itself right there with the roads like in Texas. They still have not improved them 100 years later, but that had to yeah. be a trip. The roads oh, in yeah. Texas are great, Jerry. That's not that. Don't <laughs> interrupt Mr. Floor. 100 years ago, though, I don't, the, the way he described it, he says, uh, you know, he says, actually, he goes, uh, we took wire pliers and he says, uh, you know, that we ran out of road and we'd end up in pastures. And he goes, we just cut the fences and drive through the <laughs> drive through the ranches. And, you know, until we ran to another road, he said it took him four days to get from Amarillo to Houston. Wow. Okay. And a model T, an old model T. Ford. Anyway, they went to have the shoot. And, uh, so when they got ready to go to the ring for the shoot, uh, Dutch told Roy, he says, uh, you, you stand behind me. You walk behind me to the ring. And uh, he said, uh, anything happens, I expect you to do what I taught you, you know, which was a little bit of everything, according to Roy. He didn't just teach him how to shoot. He told him how to pull eyeballs out, whatever it took, right? So uh, so anyway, in the shoot, uh, I asked Roy. Roy told me a story as a kid. And he said, I asked him, I said, well, what happened in the shoot? And he said, well, he said, I was expecting him to take him down and to uh, put a wrestling move on him. And he said, uh, they kind of both, uh, you know, uh, circled each other. They locked up a couple of times. They pushed each other back into the ropes and kind of feeling each other out. And then he said about the third time they pushed each other into the ropes, he said, Dutch was on the rope. And, the, and he said, the guy took a swing at him. And he said, Dutch hit him underneath the eye. Uh, and the orbital bone below his eye broke that orbital bone and the guy's eyeball fell out of his head and it dangled on the cord. The, there's a cord that holds your eye to your head wow. and the eyeball uh, went down. As soon as it fell out of his head, he's, uh, Roy said the guy got sick. He said, because his equilibrium was gone. He was looking straight out. He could see one thing with one eye and the other's looking at the mat. <laughs> so he started puking in the ring. And they, they rang the bell. That's it. It's over, right? You know, and uh, so then they, uh, you know, Roy stayed in the ring. Roy didn't leave until, and then they came and they put a towel over the guy's eye and they took him back to the dressing room. And uh, so uh, Roy said that uh, Mantel got out. He let him, he saw him get all the way back to the dressing room. And then he got out of the ring and then he started toward that guy's dressing room. Roy said, hey, 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 we're over here. And he goes, no, I got to go. I got to go see this guy. And uh, so he he followed him. Roy followed him, and Dutch went into the guy's dressing room uh, after he'd already done this. He still had the towel over his eye, and uh, this was the type of guy Dutch Mantel was. Uh, Roy, I said, "What did he do?" And he said, "He went straight up to him." And uh, the guy, he said, the guy looked up and he saw that it was him, and he went, "No, oh, no, no!" He started to get up to run, he, get out of the way, you know. And uh, and then Dutch said, "No, no, it's okay." 
you know, and he, that he said, but it, you know, he said, it's a good thing you quit. He said, I was already looking at that other eye. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Who was the other guy? Do you know? Or did I don't know, know the name. I never got the names, but, uh, you know, I always remember that story, you know, about wow. that. Man tell how that. could you forget that story? So how did Dutch, how did Dutch, uh, uh, so, uh, the t who was the promoter that that uh, that Dutch was doing the shooting for? Uh, I don't remember the two names of the Houston promoters. You know, I was about eight years old when he. Told I don't me guess it was Siegel or any of those guys. Yeah, I don't know, no, man. But it was way back, obviously, in yeah, nineteen, yeah. probably early nineteen twenties. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, Dutch made his money. Dutch made his money in the most unusual way. Uh, he was a small guy. And, uh, and he was a great shooter, obviously. And so it was back in the day, you know, when the, didn't everybody, everybody didn't have cars and you still rode horses. They had saloons right. and that kind of stuff. So Dutch would leave town and he would go to these small cities and he would go about uh, four or five o'clock in the afternoon and he would go to the saloon and he would start bragging about, hey, I, I may, you know, make a lot of noise. And he'd start drinking, you know, where they think he's going to get drunk. And he would say, I'm the, I can, I'm the fastest runner ever been here in this town. And I'll, I'll outrun anybody here. I'll cover all the bets, man. And he took another guy with him to handle the betting, to handle the money. And uh, so then he'd get a few people. They didn't know who he was. He'd get a few people that jumped in on the bet. And uh, they would go out in the street. Somebody would say, go. They'd mark out a distance uh, to where they're going to run. And the guy would just run off and leave him. And he'd get pissed off and jump around. He'd go back in the bar. And then he'd go, ah, damn. He goes, I, I might not have won the damn race. But he goes, I got a lot of money, by God. And I'm willing. I want to bet that I can beat anybody in here at arm wrestling. And, you know, he wasn't a big guy. Now, he'd already lost the race, right? So, you know, and everybody goes, now the bets go up a little bit. Everybody goes, wait a minute. This guy's a dumbass, right? You know, <laughs> he just went. So they, a few of them would leave the bar, and they go get their buddies, and they come back. Now the bet, the betting doubled, right? You know, everybody says, oh, this guy's going to, you know. They, so they went got the biggest, strongest guy they knew, you know, and uh, they brought him back to the bar, and then, you know, and then the, uh, they they put they set the table up and the guy grabbed hands with Dutch and then wham he just slammed Dutch's arm down on this ten seconds and Dutch jumps up ah dog this, this, this I've never been a town like this you know this I, I, so you know I I'll tell you what he goes ah nobody will beat me at wrestling and you know then they all look at each other like well this guy's an idiot he can't run he ain't strong you know how the hell is he going to beat anybody wrestling right. So uh, Dutch says, I'll tell you what, I'll double the bets. I'll double the damn bet. This is, you know, find the toughest guy you got, I'll double the bet. He said the damn saloon would empty. Everybody run out. They get, get all their money, right? They tell all their buddies. He said they wait about two hours till the saloon was solidly packed. They cover all the bets. He said it took two hours sometimes for him to get all the people to him, all, all the information. He had the one guy took care of all that. He said they walk out into the yard, into the road, the old dirt road in front of the saloon, right? They'd walk out there and they'd, they would uh, gather around like an old fight of any place else in the, in the country, you know, big circle. And Dutch would just wow. He said, within 30 seconds, he said, I'd leave him there laying and he'd be down, man, it'd be over. You know, and uh, so that's how. And then uh, two weeks later, he pick another town. And two weeks later, he pick another town. <laughs> rich. He so that's, rich. How, that's how he had Dutch made his money. You know, so something that's never changed is the damn Texas mentality. You know, there's a, <laughs> yeah. there's a market every Texas town. <laughs> Uh, he ain't talking about tech. Quit interrupting, Mr. Fuller. <laughs> no, but, but uh, you know, so so that's where he got his training. And then uh, from Roy came, uh, you know, Roy had. So, uh, so Roy Roy went up to Columbus. He said, hey, did Dutch send Roy to Columbus? Yeah, Dutch sent him to Columbus, Ohio, because Dutch had connections. You know, obviously the Houston promoter knew him. Everybody knew he was a great shooter. Yeah, yeah Dutch Mantel, he, he's one of the. The, the known icons of our business. Oh, yeah. You know, and I mean, so, you know, when Dutch recommended Roy to Ohio, Roy went to Ohio, and uh, from there, uh, you know, uh, 
he went to Tennessee. Uh, and he went into Tennessee. There was no territory there. Uh, there was, you know, professional wrestling was very. Now where exactly is Dyersburg, Tennessee? Dyersburg, Tennessee is about 15 miles from the Mississippi River, uh, just about 80 miles north of Memphis. So it's uh, just uh, east of the Mississippi, uh, sits in that cotton country, man, where uh, they had cotton fields as well. Uh, it was, uh, they still have. You go there now, and it's still that that type of country there, cotton country. But uh, so this so, is pre pre TV, obviously. So uh, how, how did pre, you... it's damn near pre wrestling, man? I mean, you know, it's way back when years ago, yeah. things going on. So you know, when he goes to Tennessee, there's no territory. There's just a few professional wrestling matches around that part of the country, and. Uh, so Roy was a pretty badass some bitch, you know. He'd been trained by a guy that was a killer, right? And uh, so, uh, so he he started. I said, I, 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 I used to travel with my granddad. I was really lucky. He used to take me a lot to Memphis in particular, and uh, and then uh, all the way there we would talk. He'd tell me stories, you know. And uh, so he told me so much history about this part of this time frame. And he said that uh, there would be these wrestling matches and that uh, he would go to the town. He would find out that they were having a match and he would go to the town and uh, he would go right in the front door. He said, it never pay. I said, you pay by, the no, I don't pay. For it. I said, what do you mean pay? And uh, so I said, well, what did you do? And he said, I'd find a dressing. And he said, when I got to the dressing room, he said, the door would be closed. He said, I kick it open. And I'd go in the dressing room and I'd say, if there was three or four wrestlers there, you know, and I'd say, look, uh, my name is Roy Welch. And, uh, and from now on, uh, I am the man for wrestling. And, uh, and I don't want to ever see any of you some bitches again. Uh, none of you don't ever call yourself a wrestler. And I want you to get your bags and get out of here right now. You know, and if you don't want to, then come on. <laughs> we'll handle it, right? And uh, so he said, then I find the promoter. And I would tell the promoter, you're done. You know, don't ever promote another wrestling match. You don't know nothing about it. And, uh, and this town is mine. And I said, and, and, how, and you built the town? He said, started in Tennessee, went to Arkansas, went to Missouri, went to Mississippi, went into Alabama. You know, and uh, at one time, he ran 12 states. He had a territory that was in 12 states in the South, uh, all the way from West Virginia to the Gulf Coast. Wow. So, uh, you know, uh, he just basically The damn road trip must have been something back then. <laughs> oh, <laughs> how can you imagine it? Yeah, they used to drive from Dyersburg, Tennessee, Jerry. The, the original tor territory was uh, in Dyersburg, where Roy lived. And uh, they drive from Dyersburg to Bluefield, West Virginia on a two-lane road. Imagine that trip. Wow. It took, uh, I asked him, I said, how long a trip like that take? He said, it took about uh, 12 hours. Wow. So if we was going to run and be there at 6 o'clock, we'd leave 6 o'clock in the morning. And then we'd drive home, be back 6 o'clock the next morning. You know? uh, so, you know, it was unbelievable. And, uh, so, and then he had some brothers, and he got his brothers uh, involved. He, he trained all of them to wrestle. And uh, then they started training guys. Uh, Herb. You've heard of Herb. Herb, yeah. Herb. Yeah, Herb was uh, Roy's, probably his toughest brother. And uh, Herb was a great wrestler, a heck of a I shooter. I always heard Herb was one of the toughest ones, too. He was a badass. And uh, and uh, Herb uh, Herb trained Herb trained David Schultz. He trained Honky Tonk Man. He wow. trained Coco Beware. He trained uh, oh, just a list of guys that went on to become big, huge stars. Uh, and he... He 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 made it. He made their training so tough. David Schultz told me a story. Well, you know, we got to talking about Herb, and he says, "Ron Herb." He said, "The first day I ever went to work out with her, with your granddad's brother Herb." He said, uh, "He he he stretched me, and he he made me scream. He made me holler." He said, "When I got home, Ron," he said, "I had to call my wife 
in the car and say, come out here and get me. I can't get out of the car. I can't even honestly get out of the car, honey. <laughs> he said, she had to come out, put her mail around my arm around her shoulder and get me into the house. You know, he said, I couldn't go back for two weeks. And, you know, and he said, when I went back, Herb was surprised to see me. He'd go, oh, you came back. Most of them don't, you know. And uh, you know how the old style was, man. Right. You know, I mean, it wasn't easy back in the day. So, you know, and then uh, along came my dad's generation. Um, and my granddad had a, several sisters. They had a family. Uh, uh, one of her sisters' name was Bond, and she married a guy named Virgil, Virgil Hatfield. Is and, that uh, one of the original Hatfields? Uh, there you go, Virgil Hatfield. Uh, <laughs> and then Virgil had three sons. And they became the Fields brothers. They dropped the Hatfield part, and they became the Fields brothers. What and I ever heard her heard a story about. I heard they were forced to drop the Hatfield uh, name that it became a Field. It, they, it might they, have been. I don't know how they actually dropped the, the Hatfield the Hatfield name and, and went into Fields. I just thought it was because they didn't. They there were so many the, the old. Uh, legend about the Hatfields and the McCoys, yeah. you know. Well, that's what it was. I heard it was so much heat with that that the, actually the governor came to him and said, you got you to drop that name. You're just <laughs> too much love for you. And those that don't know, there was a, a, a famous uh, a rivalry between two families that are down in the South, Hatfield and McCoys, right? And uh, they, they were fighting each other all the time, and it got to be one of the bloodiest battles. Yeah, uh, they in, killed in, each uh, other off. Half the families, I guess, both of them died, you know. So these Hatfields didn't shoot anybody, but they were crazy, too. <laughs> they were crazy. <laughs> and they were no different. And a little story about these guys was three brothers, uh, Lee, Bobby, and Don. Uh, so they bought my dad's. My dad, when he got started, uh, he had a territory. His first territory, Roy sent him. Roy, in order to, to, to keep control of all this south, of all the southern United States, basically, practically, as a territory, he would send relatives off to certain states and say, you're going to run this state, and you're going to run this state, and this state. And that's how he kind of kept control. Well, he sent my dad, when I was about uh, four, six years old, to Mobile, Alabama, along the Gulf Coast. There was no territory there, but a few people were running town. And, uh, and he told dad how to go get to towns, basically like he got towns. You know, just go in there. It wouldn't take over, buddy. And dad, uh, at that so point. So you came from a line of bullies, kind of like Layfield did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> keep, keep on, Oki. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, you know. The hey, Ron, brother. Ron, can you lower your camera just a, just a tad? Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Our, our okay, Lord, good. Yeah. okay, good. Okay, good. I want to make sure that the only face they don't see on here is Mr. Briscoe's. They didn't see yours. They didn't see the Tennessee stud. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so anyway, you know, guys, and I'm going to ramble a little bit here. You know, uh, go ahead, I love it. Hey, Ron, how many, how many days a week did your granddad run, Roy Welch, how many, uh, for the territory? How many days a week were they running? Oh, gosh. I mean, uh, I'm sure at, uh, one, at, at one time and probably, you know, back in the early 30s, and guys, I don't know if you've ever been around anybody that ran wrestling in the Depression. There's some great stories from Roy about wrestling during the Depression, man. Uh, so uh, uh, he ran, he was running six nights a week, six nights a week probably. Wow. And, uh, but he had such a big territory by the time he got into the 50s, they were running four or five towns a night. In, in in all these different states, right? So uh, he was running a huge territory. And uh, I got to tell you a story, and you'll love this one, Gerald, uh, about uh, a, a depression story. So Roy said that during the depression, they were running these cards with four wrestlers on the card. Uh, you had a, just two singles and then a two out of three fall tag, right? That was the whole card. So he said uh, one night uh, they, they had the all four go in the same car. He had picked up the other three guys, and one of the guys was sick. He couldn't make the town, right? So they were going on some long trip, wherever it was, and and Roy, they were all like, well, how are we going to have a match? There's just three of us. And Roy says, we'll find out. We'll figure it out. And it was, he said it was been the Depression, and everybody was hitchhiking on all the roads. And he said, that, he said I just watched the guys who was out there hitchhiking. And finally, there's a big son of a gun, right? He said, I pulled him over. <laughs> And, you know, I, we got him in the car, right? 
And, uh, and he says, we told him, you know, he says, what did you guys do? And he said, we told him we're wrestlers, you know, and uh, <laughs> he said, we're on our way to wrestle. And, uh, hey, you're a big old guy, you know, uh, we, we're short of wrestler. Would you like to wrestle tonight? And the guy says, uh, wrestle? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I never, never, never done that, you know. And they go, oh, we'll be fine, you know. It'll be easy for you. We'll make it easy for you. So, uh so they, they they took him into into the in the work, right? And then they had a single match with him, and then they took him back in and they stretched the hell out of him in the second <laughs> match, right? They but they ended up getting about 10 or 15 minutes out of him, and then they went back out in the tag, and one of them, the main guy, the, the wrestler, worked most of the tag, and they got the guy in there, and when they did, they just all they just they they just stretched him again and uh oh he was all scratched up and blown up and you know, so they got back in the dressing room. The night's over, right? They finished with the tag mat. And the guy says, uh, so Roy goes, and he goes and they check up the house, right? Now, it's during the Depression. And I said, well, how much money did you make back in those days, you know? He said, if you made 50 cent payoff, you were doing good. Wow. wow. 50 50 but, cent. you know, back in those days, you could buy a lot for 50 right. cent, right? You know, it was a lot different wow. than this so he says that he went to get the payoff and he came around and he paid the one wrestler and he paid the other wrestler and there sat the old boy head hanging there, man. He's all bloody in one eye, got his eye busted and then, you know, he's all scratched up and uh, Roy handed him his 50 cent piece. And the guy <laughs> and they really hadn't hurt him, you know, they hadn't physically hurt him at this point and the guy took the 50 cent piece and Roy said he just looked down at it in his hand like and then he said well you stupid son of bitches he goes you guys do this for 50 cents he goes y'all are nuts what the hell is the matter <laughs> he was right <laughs> Exactly right. But uh, Roy said, you know, it was fine. And then he just kept going. And then he said, finally, one of the guys said, well, you bastard, you, I'm going to take care of you now. And he just busted him. He busted him all to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know, it was a different day and time. And uh, so, you know, look, my dad got in the profession. Uh, he became a promoter like Roy did. The dad ran some tremendous shows. Uh, Mobile, Alabama. This is an example. Along the Gulf Coast, hadn't been any wrestling down there. TV cap, TV game in the 50s. The TV made wrestling, and Roy used to say, TV made wrestling, and wrestling made TV. Because television, people bought TV so they could see wrestling. Basically, is what it was. It was a great combination, television and wrestling. Okay? Right. So, uh, uh, Dad got tremendous audience, tremendous audience. Roy, and, can, can we back up just a second, though? Uh, how did they promote without TV back in there? Was it just newspapers or just go into town and barge the, them, like you said, go in and set up people? Or how Remember it? the old wrestling cards? Yeah. Remember the old wrestling cards? That's where you used to do it. Hell, when I went to Knoxville and started uh, Southeastern Wrestling, I was using wrestling cards. My dad built territories using wrestling cards. And he had a great gimmick in mind. When you had the wrestling card, you would have these ladies take them around and put them in the stores because they could get things done that a man couldn't get done, you know. So uh, they'd take the card, and Dad came up with this idea of having a little coupon called a cut-rate ticket. So they'd take the card and a handful of these cut-rate tickets, and they would say, sir, would you mind if I put this card in your window?" And, uh, and then the, some of them would go, no, I don't want that. You know, I don't really want that in my window. And they'd say, how about would you like to have a cut rate ticket? Two or three cut rate tickets, right? You know, and uh, so they and they would then say, oh, yeah, yeah. Then they started coming a little bit. And then they got to wanting handfuls of cut rate tickets. You know, they were like, hey, give me some more of those cut rate tickets, you know. So. Anyway, that's kind of how they promoted before television came along. Uh, posters were big. And uh, it's the biggest thing on the Internet nowadays. You look at people and what the value of posters are. Yeah, those, those southern posters, yeah. It's tremendous. It's tremendous. So, uh, you know, so that's how they did it before that. So, anyway, TV comes, and it really catches things on fire. 
So uh, Mario Galento, and you and I talked about him a couple of days ago, uh, Joe. Uh, Mario Galento uh, was the biggest heel in, in Dad's territory. And uh, Dad wasn't, he started out as just a promoter. He, nobody knew he was an actually a wrestler. And uh, then they worked an angle in which Mario got mad at him. He was the promoter and he, and he whacked him. He busted his eye and he, you know, and I, I'm talking about he really busted his eye hard way. So back in those days, there wasn't any blade. It was all hard way. <laughs> hard way. Everybody hard way. Dad told me, Mario Galento, he said, I used to pay guys $25 for a hard way. If a guy busted his eye, let somebody bust him a hard way, I'd pay him 25 bucks. He said, Mario Galento stopped me from it because in one month, he's busted his eye 26 times. <laughs> <laughs> every night, every night he busted an eye, right? So, uh, so uh, they worked a big angle. Uh, they... Uh, Dad said, you know, I'm not a wrestler, but I'm training. And, uh, you know, and you, nobody's ever going to do that to me again. And, uh, and I, and I'm going to, I'm going to be ready. And within a year, I'm going to, I'm going to make you pay for this, man. And uh, so uh, they, they worked an angle when it came time for the big match uh, where they ran into each other in a restaurant, downtown Mobile, and they actually got into a fight. And, uh, and so many people were watching the television that the cops came to break up the fight, and they were scared of the wrestlers. They were scared of Galento and Dad. They all backed off, and they let them fight. And they fought <laughs> out of the restaurant, out into the street, and Dad had a Cadillac. And Dad said he grabbed Mario Galento by the back of the head. The Galento had long hair, like a woman's hair. He grabbed him by his hair, and he said he slammed his face into his Cadillac hood so hard that it dented the hood. <laughs> and, uh, that was just part of the fight. They were both bloody. They took and anybody off. that's ever been around those old Cadillacs, they were made of steel. I mean, oh yeah, you couldn't dent them. <laughs> you couldn't. <laughs> no. no. Yeah, when you when you dented the hood of a Cadillac, you, yeah. you that was a pretty good bump, right? There. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so they booked the card. They booked the match after about a year's buildup. Uh, they drew forty thousand people in the Ladd Memorial Football wow. Stadium, Mobile, Alabama, nineteen fifty eight. Wow. Wow. So, you know, uh, it wow. was a different day and time, man. And uh, they did business in a different way, too, obviously. So, uh, hey, Ron, when did people figure out there was an easier way to get juice? <laughs> I mean, when 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 was when was it that it, yeah. it, it kind of came? I bet in it happened when they when you got your eye busted about eight or ten times. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I wonder who who was the one that came up with the blade idea. <laughs> that they guys, there's an easier way out of here. Well, yeah. That isn't is an easy way, by the way, either. <laughs> but it was no, sure a lot no. easier than. Hard but there's a hell of a lot better to get your head busted in. <laughs> you ever had a hard way, Jerry? Uh, yeah, only Anderson gave me a couple. There you I go, Adam. I've had a couple of them. My dad and them used to do it regularly. Like I said, Galento used to collect, uh, you know, uh, if he worked six nights a week, he'd collect uh, five nights worth of hard ways. Uh, Dad said he one time he was working with him and he said that Galento had probably been hit in the head with a chair by a fan. He heard that fan got him with a chair from behind earlier in the week. And he might have charged Dad for that hard way, too. I <laughs> hey, Otto Vance, I don't, you know, you guys know Otto. Otto was working with, with Leon White before he became Big Van Vader over in uh, Europe. And at one point, Otto called the spot, break my nose. Yeah. And literally, that's what he wanted. And and popped him right in the nose, broke his nose, blood everywhere. And that was that was a called spot. That was a called spot. You know, Otto was one of those old school tough guys. Oh, I mean, you know, uh, and, and there's nothing more believable than that. So in the match that they had 40,000 people there. Now, I'm a, I was about, uh, I was in the second grade. And uh, so I didn't get to go to the match. Uh, they had 40,000 people. Uh, Dad said the match only lasted five minutes. He said the deal was he sent the deal to finish over to Galento, and he said uh, one working punch and one shooting punch. And he said no no wrestling. You know, so they just went in and had a five-minute – he said they lasted about five minutes. But, uh, but I had a guy that was there, one of the wrestlers that was there, an old-timer man. He said, I, I saw that match, Ron, and he goes uh, – he says, the front first three rows were empty three minutes after that match started. He said, the blood was going to three rows back wow. when they hit each other, right? Wow. 
And uh, he busted, Galento had 42 stitches in one eye. Uh, all over. Busted now, now that picture going around of Mario Galento, you can go on Twitter, folks out there. You can go on Twitter or Facebook and you can see, or you can go and, and, and Google Mario Galento. You could see that picture with both the eyes puffed out and just black and his nose spread across his face. It, was that was that afterward? After that, that? after that match, yeah. that was after that match, and, they, and it so says there's a lot of people taking credit for that picture. But the, the truth of the matter is, it was your dad after that match at forty thousand people. Absolutely, there. and my dad had Hey, Jerry. If you can see that, that's the picture. Oh there wow, you, yeah. <laughs> look, uh, yeah, I mean, you don't. That's a, wow. just amazing shot right there, and now faster there. <laughs> I, I tell you what, as bad as Mario looked, my father had both his eyes were so black and so swollen out that for two weeks he couldn't open them. They, wow. they the blood just stayed in his eyes. And my mom, I remember, drove him around in the car. When he wanted to go somewhere, she'd take him to wherever he had to go uh, for two weeks. I remember as a as a in a second grader watching him go up in the mirror, and the first time I ever saw him open his eye. He, he took his finger and he spread his eye open and blood shot out on the mirror. Ooh. You know, wow. like, all that pressure in there. Oh, so, you know, I mean, uh, I actually, well, I actually worked with Mario Galento when I was a rookie and he scared me to death just as <laughs> presence in the ring. He was a great heel, it. huh? Yeah, he was a great heel. <laughs> he was a monumental heel and he was in fantastic shape and he did fantastic interviews. So, Dad and them did this deal with Mario, and Mario and him became a territory builder. Once he sold uh, the Mobile Territory to the Fields Brothers, he went to Memphis, and he made Memphis he made Memphis the town that it became, because uh, he was so uh, he he just did it in a different way, man. And he did the hard ways, and uh, he did tremendous advertising everywhere. But uh, uh, when he went to Memphis. He took Mario there. They did a, they had to, they, and, and Spudding Monroe, they drew in the baseball stadium. They didn't have a football stadium at that time in Memphis. They drew 30,000 people in the baseball stadium with Mar, with uh, Spudding Monroe against Billy Wicks, who was an old Billy wrestler Wicks. from Minnesota. You ever hear Billy yeah, Wicks? Yeah, a football player and uh, wrestler, yeah. He came, and he became a police uh, police chief for Memphis, Tennessee. Right. He became a policeman later on. They drew uh, thirty thousand people in uh, in in, in uh, Memphis in the baseball stadium. Right. And I remember watching that match as a kid. He let me go. Me and my brother go and watch the match. And uh, is in a baseball stadium. Uh, and uh, they put the ba they brought the Cadillac. It was for a Cadillac. The winner won a Cadillac. It was a big, long tournament. This was the finals of the tournament. It ended up best heel and the best baby face, obviously. And they brought the Cadillac out onto the field. The stadium was totally full. The field was full. It was, like, amazing. I'd never seen so many people. Uh, and when Wicks won the car, he went out to the car, and he had busted his eye the hard way, so he was bleeding. And he went to his brand new Cadillac and he opened the door to his car and he got in this brand new Cadillac, all bloody as hell. Right. And the plan was that he was going to drive the Cadillac out at center field. They had the gate to open up and the commercial Avenue, which is one of the biggest streets in Memphis was right behind the stadium. And they was going to drive out on the street and drive the Cadillac off. Well, there was so many people on the field he couldn't drive the car because, you know, they, they couldn't get there. That, this is the honest to God truth. That I watched this happen. I was truly amazed. I'll never forget it. They opened the gate, center field. He got in the car. He's all bloody as hell. The fans picked up that Cadillac and carried it out of that stadium and set it down in the street. Wow. And he drove away. <laughs> that's now that's having that's having people's attention. That, that's that, over. <laughs> wow! So, and I can't even change a, a tire on a rental car with a car jack. <laughs> 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 right, right. right. That, that's something that I've, I've always been. Uh, what what was the the deal with the name change? Were there just too many Welches in the business, so so much? <laughs> 
got a full herd of what? You, know, you guys were controlling everything. It was a family. That's it. That's, That's it. it. You, okay. I figured that was just too okay, many watches. You know, so you had somebody. How did Fuller come out? Fuller Brushman or what? Well, here's it's a good story. So uh, you know, uh, there were four 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 brothers. There was Roy and Herb and Jack and Jack, you know, who was one of the older ones. And then twenty years later, Lester was born. So there were the four brothers. And uh, so when Dad got involved, uh, you know, there were already four Welches. And I asked him, uh, you know, how would you get the name Fuller? Just like you're asking, right? And he says, uh, well, he goes, one night, he goes, I was wrestling as Ed Welch. And he goes, I, wasn't, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, be another Welch. And I wanted to make my name on my own. And then he says, they, they, they had a card there. And he says, uh, they had a guy on the card named Buddy Fuller. And he says, uh, they, he didn't show up. And, uh, and he said, the promoter came to me and he says, you know, uh, we got a guy that ain't here tonight, you know, and uh, uh, his name was Buddy Fuller. He goes, uh, you know, and, and we, I know you're Roy Welch's son and, you know, but uh, would you substitute for it? Dad said, uh, he said, I sat there and I thought a little bit. He goes, I kind of like that name. He goes, uh, uh, hell yeah. So he said, I became Buddy Fuller. And, you uh, know, hey, that was the first Fuller then. Yeah, first Fuller. Yeah. Yep, uh, Dad started in. Uh, did only he ever? Did he ever, ever run into the original Buddy Fuller? <laughs> no, yeah, and I asked him. He said, "No, I never did meet the guy." You know, <laughs> but oddly enough, I had somebody on social media not too long ago that said, "Ron, he sent me a card from somewhere up in uh, Michigan with Buddy Fuller on it." Right, and I was thinking, is that the same? Possibly the same Buddy Fuller that my old man stole his name? You know, so <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, you know, so hell, we got there. You know, then there's only three fullers. It's just my dad and uh, me and Rob. Right. And uh, so, uh, and then I had a son. I got a son that six uh, ten that wrestled uh, one match. So I'm a, he's a fourth generation wrestler. You know, I'm a third generation. He's a fourth generation wrestler. Jimmy Golden, a cousin, has a son that's uh, six ten. And uh, and he wrestles quite a Jimmy few. Jimmy's son is six ten. Man, you guys had wow. some some reach. I, I, I remember Jimmy. What what was Jimmy's dad's name? Bill. Bill, Bill Golden. Bill. I worked for him somewhere in Louisiana, I believe it was. Oh yeah. I was just starting out. Yeah. So you know they we spread out all over everywhere, man. Uh, dad just uh, became a promoter that uh, he built territories. He went into Arizona when nobody had ever been able to draw money in Arizona in nineteen sixties. And uh, we left Arizona with uh, with the biggest crowd. Uh, he had a baseball stadium in Phoenix that uh, sold out. Uh, and uh, Dad worked all these crazy angles. I mean, he he was brilliant in in a lot of different ways. Uh, he had a he had an angle. He had uh, Ted DiBiase's dad. Uh, uh, what's his first name? Can't remember his first name right now. You know. Uh, anyway, he was a great wrestler, and uh, so. Uh, uh, he was the he, he was dad's top heel, and dad found this big huge guy that didn't know anything about wrestling, and he put him on the uh, in the ringside seats, and uh, they did live TV there on Wednesday nights in Phoenix, Arizona back in the day. And uh, hey, had, uh, I'm sorry, Mike, Mike DiBiase. I just Mike DiBiase, yeah. yes sir, Mike DiBiase. Uh, and Mike, what a great wrestler he was! Yeah, great. he was am amateur champion at the University of Kansas. Yeah, right? he, he was obviously and, and, a hell of a wrestler, all big eight football player, and and yeah. and and and, and as an all American wrestler, two sports, one of the first. Great guy, great heel, great heel. And uh, so Dad gets this baby face, this big huge guy, and he sets him on the on the edge of the end of the row on the on ringside. And they're, they're selling out this town. And they ran in the, the building, oddly enough, was Madison Square Garden, Phoenix, right, Arizona. In Phoenix, yeah. I've been by that building. I never worked there, but I've been by that building. Uh, man, I've been in that building many, many times. And uh, so uh, so DiBiase comes to the ring one night, and this guy jumps up in his face in the, in the, in the, middle, of the, in the middle of the TV tape. And uh, DiBiase, uh, you just kind of sidesteps him and goes on. The guy next week gets a little more bold, a little, little more bold. And uh, finally, he becomes a little talk in the town. You know, uh, fans are going, hey, that big son of a bitch. What could he do to Ted DiBiase, you know? And uh, so finally, uh, 
they bring him on TV. And I'm a big kid. I'm a mark. I'm 16 years old at this point, you know, and I'm watching this and I'm going, what the hell is dad doing? Why don't they just knock the shit out of this guy and get rid of him? You know, right? You know, it's a mark. You know, what the, what the, what are they doing? You know, so uh, they bring him on TV, you know, and they, they say, they, they interview him. They go, hey, what's your name? We see you here every week now and you're trying to, you picking on a big dude, DiBiase, and, you know, uh, what's the story? You know, and the guy says, well, I don't know nothing about wrestling, you know, but he had a, he's a big old dude, you know, and he balled up his fist. He said, but I tell you, if I could hit that son of a gun with this, he goes, I know I'll be champion. You know, ain't no <laughs> doubt about it, right? So, hey, so they, they then they, then dad took it another step. He had his second best heel. Then the guy got up one night and he started into all this stuff like this. And DiBiase now is trying to avoid him a little bit. And the dad has that he'll go up to the ring, get the microphone, send his big ass in here. Yeah, I'm going to finish him. And I'm like a big mark. I'm like, hey, that's about time. God, don't go and get him, right? And uh, so they get, send the guy in there. And by golly, the wrestler runs at him. Guy's got his back turned. He runs at him. And that guy turns around and hits him with that big right hand. And down he went. And they covered him one, two, three. That building exploded, right? They were like, wow, look at this guy. So, you know. And that's the way he built up to drawing 30,000 people in Phoenix, Arizona, with this mark against Mike DiBiase. For the wow. Arizona. How did your dad end up going to Arizona? That, that's, that doesn't few, – so few people have been through Arizona. How did he end up there? Oh, I'll tell you, I don't know really. You know, my dad's a, kind of a goofy. You know, dad, dad he, he ran these great territories. He was a tremendous promoter. And – uh so once he sold Mobile, and he sold Mobile, I asked him, why do you sell Mobile? It's 40,000 people and you sell it. I, he, says, he says, I couldn't get no bigger than that. I wanted to go someplace else, do it again. So uh, he went to Memphis. He stayed in Memphis for a while. And then we bought a little farm in Mississippi just outside of Memphis. And uh, then uh, he had a friend that used to print the cards for him. His, his posters, we're talking about posters that printed his posters for him that wanted to be a promoter. And he went out to Arizona and he called dad. He'd been out there for three months. He couldn't draw anything. And he said, there's a lot of people here, big population. Come to Arizona. Let's see what we can do. We'll be partners. So dad went out, took us out to Arizona. And you're right. That's pretty far out there. Wasn't nobody. I don't think Arizona had, had probably any promotion, very few promotions prior to dad going out there. But he lit it up. And when he lit it up, he the two weeks later, we left. We moved. I said, Where we, why? He said, you got the thing on fire. What, what's the story? And he goes, hey, I can't get no bigger in the stadium. It's all, all sold out. <laughs> he goes, we got to go. We went back to the farm and farmed for two years. He didn't even wrestle a damn time. It was ridiculous. Was your dad's whole key creative storylines? Was or was it the, the the placards, the posters, the promotion? What was or was it all the above? It was all the above, uh, and I tell you what he did. Uh, that I, nobody, nobody did, and uh, and I kind of got into this from hockey. I learned this when I got my hockey business. Uh, I, I took advantage of, of what my dad had done, but. When he went to Memphis, Memphis was had been a dead city for many, many years. It's the greatest wrestling city, one of the greatest wrestling cities in the country. But it wasn't before Dad went there. And when he went there, he did everything. He put out posters. So uh, you couldn't go on every cab on the top of them was wrestling king of sports. The buses, the back of the buses. He did every kind of advertising you could think of. Uh, and then he finally did billboards. And uh, once he did the billboard, uh, you know, that, that thing did, just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger uh, until uh, until he drew the big crowd. And that was all he could do. It was the biggest building in town, biggest facility in town. I can't be better than that. So go somewhere else. But uh, he well, ever, would he sell the territory or would the, did he actually own the territory or would he just come in as, as, a, as a mercenary sort of? That's another great story, Joe. And it's kind of about my crazy family. My grandfather, Roy, obviously had his office in Nashville, Tennessee. 
Dad got control of Memphis. Dad bought Memphis from Les Wolf, who was out of Texas, Henrietta, Texas. Uh, Les Wolf was a great wrestler, big old time star. Uh, and uh, Les Wolf uh, sold Memphis to Dad. And Les stayed there all the years that Dad was there and uh, helped him run it. They became great friends. Les went to Atlanta when we moved to Atlanta. He was always Dad's friend after that. But uh, that's how he got into Atlanta. I mean, into Memphis. Um, he bought it basically from Les. And then he was there for three years. Uh, he had the town all cranked up and doing great. And uh, athletic commission. Uh, Roy, Roy and my dad had a very, very uh, odd relationship. There wasn't much love, I guess, is the way to put it, between my dad and my granddad. Maybe it was a conflict of, of uh, you know, who's the best. You know, uh, I don't know what it was exactly, but Roy controlled the athletic commission and Roy started uh, having the athletic commission give my dad a real problem about what he could do in the ring and all this different thing. You can't, no, you can't have that guy do that anymore. You can't do have them do this and you can't have them do that. Well, the town's selling out. It's a monster success. And uh, so dad, you know, says, uh, yeah, we, you know, take it. He goes, hey, you know, I don't care. He goes, uh, you know, so Roy was behind it. So my granddad ended up with Memphis. Basically, dad, I don't think sold it. I think he just walked away from Memphis and said, take it. You can have it. And uh, so that's pretty stupid in a way, no doubt. But uh, but uh, it was kind of his, his his mindset. He had his he had his own way of doing things. Did they ever make up later in life? I mean, was that really a contentious where they were actually at each other? Uh, uh, yeah. Openly? Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did, John. Uh, actually, uh, Dad had a big, huge farm uh, in the late 70s. Uh, Roy had retired from Nashville and the, owning the territory and booking wrestling, all of that. And uh, and he he uh, he was really down. Uh, and, and, uh, he had no place to live. Uh, him and his wife had a problem, and uh, they got divorced after 50 years of marriage. And, and – uh, so, and he Roy was uh, suffering from dementia, which a lot of wrestlers are. We you know the reason for that. Take a lot of head shots, you know, in that in our sport. And uh, so, uh, you know, uh, so Dad had this big, huge farm. Dad had a beautiful ranch. had a, had a, had his own airport on on his. In, yeah, on it his was farm. over two thousand acres. For two thousand acres. It's a two thousand acre ranch. Uh, cows and uh, had an airport on it. And he flew his own plane. I had a friend that your dad used to buy cattle from down, from down in America's Georgia. He used to go down and buy cattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dad, uh, dad, dad had a big operation going. So he took one of the houses uh, that he had on his property and uh, he put Roy in that house. And he took care of Roy. Him and my mom took care of Roy. Took that's Roy cool. Died. Yeah, um, that's great. They, they did. They did. They did. The, they did make up. That's all. Awesome. Awesome. Mr. Briscoe asked me one time, he goes, you think I've got any dementia? I said, you're from Oklahoma. How the hell could you tell? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, Ron, Ron you'll love this. Jerry, Jerry had a heart attack a few years ago, and, and I called down to Barbara's wife, and I said, hey, how's Jerry doing? She said, oh, my goodness. I said, he's slurring his words, doesn't know where he is. I said, that's Friday afternoon. <laughs> 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 what I put up with, Rob. <laughs> uh, I got one story here, guys. This is kind of a little bit, uh, we're jumping around here a little bit, uh, you know, but uh, once I got my Southeastern Territory started, Ron Wright was the star. Right. And had been for many years before I came. He was the number one heel in that Eastern Tennessee area. And uh, so uh, Ron Wright had an airplane. If you can believe that. If you know Ron, no, I can't. <laughs> you believe Ron Wright could fly an airplane. Uh, anyway, Ron Wright uh, wanted if one Ronnie time. Ronnie Garvin could fly an airplane. Ronnie yeah, Ronnie Garvin, <laughs> can you believe that? You know. <laughs> so uh, Ron Wright says to me, he says, your, your daddy's got a ranch over there. We were working in Memphis. And instead of driving, he said, you know, your dad's got a ranch over there. He's got an airport on it. He says, well, why don't the uh, – why don't you just get in a plane with me and we'll fly over there, you know, and fly to Memphis, you know? And, and so I said, uh, okay, you know, and so Ron Wright had a brother named Don. So he had a little uh, two engine, twin engine plane. And so we, 
got in this plane and, uh, you know, only four seats in it. And I'm sitting in the back and uh, we start flying across the state to Memphis. And uh, so then we get fairly close to about 60 miles out of Memphis. And he says, uh, your daddy's got, where is your daddy's ranch? I said, it's in Bolivar, Tennessee. He goes, well, we got to be pretty close to Bolivar, you know. He goes, uh, uh, let's let's see if we can find your his ranch. And I said, well, okay, if you want to, you know. So they he, here's here's the way kind of probability was. So he got to fly in low altitude around all of the the uh, water tanks of all the cities because <laughs> that's where you had, saw the name, right? <laughs> <laughs> Right on the like map. <laughs> yeah, so that was his map. So we flew around the in circles for about 30, 40 minutes, and there it was. That's Bolivar. There it is. Now, where's your dad, daddy? I said, I don't know. It, it's five uh, five miles from here, man. So finally, we spot his ranch, and there's his runway. Now, as you mentioned, he bought a lot of cows, right? So he had a runway, but he couldn't just land his plane anytime he wanted to and have the cows in the field because the cows could be on the runway, right? You know, so he 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 fenced off his runway. So uh, so and Dad had a single engine plane. Now Ron Wright's got a twin engine plane, a little more powerful. Needs so that, a little that's more. That's where you guys' love of airplanes came about then, because uh, you guys always had to work around planes. Oh yeah, yeah. Dad had a plane. Lester had a plane. Everybody yeah. had a plane. Now, Ron Wright, so me and Ron Wright and his brother, we fly around and we find the, the, the little airport, the little the little runway. Basically, in the airport, it's just a runway. And uh, so he tears the Donnie. He goes, Donnie, he had that taste in it, this Tennessee accent. Donnie goes, do you think we can set her down there? I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, we ain't landing. You know, we ain't going to Oh, yeah, Ron, we, we, I believe we can do it. He said, so they buzzed the runway, right? <laughs> Just to see, about 20 feet off the runway. And I'm like, ah, dang, guys, come on. Let's go home. Let's go on the bench. <laughs> you know, so, so they buzzed the runway. And then he Don says, I think we can do it, Donnie. We'll land or we can do it. And I'm I'm, I'm begging him. No, no, God, <laughs> just don't do this. So anyway, here we come. So we land on that runway. We get down to the end of the runway. Dad's plane sitting off to the side. I think we're going to smash into the plane, right? I mean, he's he's got the, he's got both feet on the brakes, and that plane is just bucking, man. And I'm going, oh gosh, I'm like, covering my eyes. Oh, I can't watch it. And uh, then I got down the end of the runway, and he turned sideways, the plane sideways, and it skipped on its the on this on its tires and and stopped right there at the end of the fence. And I was like. Uh, first, I said to myself, I ain't getting out on this thing going out. <laughs> <laughs> so dad sees us and he comes down from the big house and he takes us up. We have coffee and all that stuff. And uh, and then dad asks the critical question, you know, end of it. You know, he, he knows what the deal is. And he goes, uh, well, Ron, he goes, uh, you think you can uh, get her out of here? <laughs> <laughs> you got the plane here now, but what are you yeah. going to do? Right. Yeah, you got to get it out. <laughs> Runway, and you know, uh, and so, uh, and so I said, "Well, I tell you what, I'm going to make it a little easier. I'm going to take my ass out there. You take me. You can drive me from here to, to <laughs> tonight." So anyway, we go down, and we get they get in that park. I know. So, so uh, <laughs> Ron gets the plane situated. He stopped it in the side where the wheels are just bounced up to the fence. We we've squared around. We get it looking down the runway, and he gets in there and he revs up the engine as about as fast as it goes. And then he opens a little cockpit window and he screams out there. He goes, "Hook your arm over the wing, Ron!" And he got Dad on one wing. He hooked his arm over the wing, and he got me on the other wing. We got our arm, and he's got the brakes in on the plane, and it's just sitting there bouncing on the runway. Like, and then he goes, and then he screams out the window, "Let her go!" And uh, <laughs> let her go. <laughs> and here they go down that. And I'm just, bro, me and Dad's just standing there watching, like, oh, they gonna, they gonna make it. <laughs> it's not gonna happen. And they cleared that fence by, it couldn't be more than six inches. Uh, and then uh, Ron used to ask me all the time after that, you want to go ride with me, Ron? You want to Hell no, Ron. <laughs> oh, boy. Crazy, crazy. Crazy world, man. Crazy, 
crazy wrestlers. That's what it's all about. So when did you first become to start becoming the promoter yourself? Well, I wrestled, uh, started in 1970 playing basketball at Miami. And I started wrestling in 1970 in Georgia territory. You know, yeah, you went to Miami University, right? Yeah, University yeah, of Miami. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah went there uh, uh, for three years. Went to Clemson my freshman year, transferred to Miami. So you're, you're playing high school ball in Georgia, right? Not in Tennessee, but you were in, your family was in Atlanta at that time, running Atlanta. Yeah, when I was in high school, I was in Atlanta. That I got recruited out of Clemson and then uh, – I went to Clemson, man, and found out that they had 7,000 guys and 7, 700 girls. I went there when it was spring break, and, I, and there was nobody on campus. They didn't tell me that there's no girls here, Ron. Wow. It was an old military school. Oh. I, I, so they said, halfway through the year, I said, I'm looking for another place to go next year. Were well, so, you highly recruited around your watch, six foot eight, six foot nine? Or what? Yeah, I was uh, I was all state of Georgia and uh, about to six, eight uh, as a senior. So uh, I grew another inch uh, after that, uh, about when I went to Clemson. So, yeah, I was pretty highly recruited. Yeah, I could have gone your, a lot. Your dad, your dad was against your basketball career too, right? Oh yeah, dad, dad hated it. You know, he just he, he despised it. You know, he said, uh, "You're just going to be a skinny guy all your life, man." And he goes, "You need to get the weight room. You need to, you know." He wanted me to do something else all the time. But, uh, yeah, so he, you told me you told me a funny story recently while you while you were at Miami. Your dad, being the ultimate promoter, came up with a great angle for you during your basketball career at at uh, at Miami. Tell and kind of share that story with John and our audience out there exactly what happened uh, during that thing. Uh, well, that was my last year of uh, 69. I actually got out of there in 70 in University of Miami. Uh, but uh, in uh, 69, uh, played against a lot of great teams. Uh, Miami was not in the, uh, not like they are now in the, uh, the conference there. You know, uh, uh, they had they were independent. But we played all over the country. We I played against UCLA that year. It's a national championship year for them. Who, Sydney, so who was on their team at the time you played there? Huh? Who was a, who was on their team when you were playing against you? When remember? I played there, it was Sidney Wicks and Curtis Rowe was the uh, forwards. Uh, I can't remember the center's name, but Henry Bibby and John Vallely was the guards. There's a national championship team. They, they, they were great. Gosh, that was like, like John Wooden years, right? John Wooden. They, this was tail end of it. Well, it was actually a little past the middle of it. Jabbar had gone the year before. Jabbar had graduated the year before. I went in there the year after, and it was a totally different team. I bet Jabbar. you were glad Jabbar was going on. <laughs> uh, yeah. I would have loved to play against Jabbar. Oh, of course, yeah. You know, so, but anyway, I played against some great centers, man, uh, because we were an independent and we were a big name school. So I played against Artis Gilmore. Artis Gilmore was a seven two, about seven two. He was a good seven one, you know. Uh, and uh, and uh, and I played against the, uh, the the center in the UCLA. We played at Houston. Played against a great Houston team. Uh, gosh, we we played a. Great a great played a great schedule, but uh, so Dad and I and I never tell you this story, Jerry, but uh, we played early in that season against Jacksonville. Jacksonville is where Artis Gilmore played, and uh, Jacksonville had two seven footers on their team, uh, and uh, so in that game in Jacksonville, we played in the same building that we wrestled in there, big old round building in Jacksonville. Big old Coliseum, man. There you go, and uh, so uh, uh. They had had a big fight the week before the game. We played against them. Jacksonville had been into a fight with another basketball team, and it was a big deal and around the country. Got a lot of publicity, and I saw the deal that you know Gilmore smacked somebody. And it, it was a bad deal. It was a really nasty deal. So Dad had never been uh, to one of my basketball games in college so far. It was early on in that year, and so. Uh, he came. He flew down to Jacksonville, him and my mom, to watch me play. And so in that game, <laughs> in that game, about somewhere in the game, uh, it, I was about half court, and uh, and somebody got a long pass to the guard. It was just the guard and me, both headed toward the goal. And it, he was he had the ball. He, he was about to score. 
and it had the old the old posts that were set up, the goals uh, set up with the steel posts, the stanchions, all the bars back in there. It was a maze of bars, right? And uh, so when he he went up to hit to, to go up to shoot the deal, uh, to make the shot. And, uh, I couldn't keep from, I was running too fast and I didn't do it on purpose, but, uh, I couldn't stop. And my hit, my shoulder hit him in the hip <coughs> and it drove him <coughs> through those bars and he disappeared in the goal. Right. <laughs> out. Now this is a big time school. They, they ended up in the national right. championship in the, in the, in, back in, 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 in the last four, I think it was. So, uh, Anyway, when I did that, the building stood up. And, you know, I was a heel. Oh, big <laughs> heel. I mean, they was like, whoa, they were really booing. And I uh, had Ron, my- Ron, I'm going to interrupt you again here. Uh, you, you were, you know, you're playing ball, and your dad was a big star in Florida at the time also, or not? maybe not at that time, but during, during the course of your career, he was a big wrestling star. Right. Did they ever play up on that? You know, you've been the son of a professional wrestler or anything. No, never used it, but uh, Gordon used it when I started wrestling. Right. Yeah, I remember that. Gordon used the basketball quite a bit yeah. once he started uh, trying to, to push me some, you know. So so anyway, this guard goes slamming through this and through the pipes. He don't get up. He's 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 in he's down. He's inside the pipes and all that. And uh the and I had my back to the bench, and I didn't do it on purpose. I really expected – I got this – they had a fight last week. Oh, my God, this is it. They're going to come. And I turned around and squared off at the bench. <laughs> they were already on their feet, right? Uh-huh. And when I squared off at the bench, oh, boy, here it came, right? And they started coming. And uh, and so they, they, they're the referees kind of good. Everybody – Nobody actually threw a punch, right? But the building was alive. I mean, the building was all, everybody was on their feet. I can imagine the old man sitting up there going, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh great. that's what I want to see, right? Uh-huh. So anyway, we're go- now we get to the story you're talking about, Jerry. So, uh, so after we did it, after we got the last game of the season, it was my last game of the you know, and we were playing against Jacksonville, Artis Gilmore. And Dad remembered Artis Gilmore from the early game in Jacksonville. The big, tall guy, yeah. You know, I said, Dad, he's a big star, man, in the country. You know, and uh, and he, he so we went to have breakfast that day of the game. And uh, he said, uh, he said, he said, you don't run. He goes, you, this is it for you. This is your end of your basketball. You can't, you, you know. And I could have maybe played pro ball. I, I could have possibly gone there if I wanted to. But uh, he said, uh, you know, you you need to do something. Right? Do something today that uh, sets you up as a big time wrestler for your whole life. You know? <laughs> and, uh, like, Knowing like, your dad, I could just see those wheels turning. Yeah, over. my eyes are rolling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. So I'm like, whoa, dad, come. On. You know what? What? What am I going to put? I'll tell you. And I said, are you serious? Are you, what, what, do you, what do you got? And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He says, you're playing against that big arm of Skillmore, right? He goes, there'll be a lot of press there, you know. And he goes, uh, and they'll be, you'll be running up and down the court. And, you know, and he said, he won't be expecting nothing. And he goes, uh, well, what you need to do is you somewhere during that game, and he's down there, and he's coming toward you. And he says, you just kind of plant yourself in front of him. And then you scoop slam his ass. <laughs> Bam, the that basketball. <laughs> and he was dead ass serious, too, wasn't he? <laughs> I, was, I was like, oh, dad, God, are you serious? You know, hell yeah, I'm serious. Think about it, boy. He goes, you <laughs> all across the country, man. He goes, you'll start your career wrestling as a big heel, man. You'll be. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, and, I, and, I, and I told you, I told you, Jerry, I found myself about three or four times during that game. Yeah. <laughs> just, just thinking about it. Well, maybe, maybe. And he was right. <laughs> it would have made me a huge star. 
I just said that artist deal, but what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, man. Uh, so you know, I started my career. I finally, uh, I wrestled. I went to seven. I spent uh, four years in Florida. And uh, Jerry, uh, who who started you? Did you break in down here with Hero, or or did it, who who was who was your trainer? I'm uh, sure, and, sure you've been trained all your life. For the, for the oh, point. you mean in uh, in basketball? No, and 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 wrestling. After 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 you did slam hardest Gilmore thing. Well, I went, <laughs> you know, I, I'd been training. You know, well, gosh, uh, being the son of a being the son and the grandson of a wrestler. I mean, me and me and Rob been training all our lives, yeah, basically. Yeah. You know, uh, Dad had us a wrestling ring in our backyard. He had a wrestling ring in our backyard. Uh, uh, once I was probably 14 years old from 14 to, to I left to go to college, you know? So, and we were shooting, he had a, he had an old, old time wrestler. I don't know if you know this name, Gerald, the Charlie Carr. I don't know if you ever heard of Charlie Carr, but Charlie Carr was a great old shooter. Uh, he taught so many great wrestlers. One of the guys you'll know for sure. He taught uh, Joe, Joe McCarthy. I know Joe McCarthy. Yeah. yeah. Joe McCarthy had to shoot. That's one of the guys. He taught my dad. He taught um, my brother and I. Oh, gosh, he taught a number of great wrestlers how to shoot. So, you know, we had that training. And then when I went in 1970 after finishing college, uh, Corsica Good Joe. Corsica Good Gene. Corsica Good Gene, yeah. Corsica Good Gene took me and Rob, and he trained us. And another funny story here. <laughs> He trained us, and uh, and then Dad, and he and he told my dad. He said, uh, when he when he when he agreed to do it, he said, "But buddy, he said, I don't want you being there ever." Because <laughs> <laughs> my dad it. was kind of stiff, and you know, he wasn't a great worker, you know, and uh, and he was a little tough in the ring to deal with, and uh, so uh, so of course, Gene taught us to to, to wrestle, and uh, and then I remember. We are at the time we are going to take our first, get our first match. Rob had already started for me a little bit, but uh, Dad showed up one day. And uh, so he, <laughs> and Corsica Gene just shook his head like, oh, no, no, I ain't good, you know. So, and you know, Dad said, well, let me just show the boy here. And he's talking about Rob to start with. Let me just show old Rob here how to throw a punch. <laughs> and he grabbed Rob and he, he took his chin and he shoved him back into the turnbuckle, and he shoved his chin back, and uh, and then he reared back to give him a shot with a forearm, basically across the chest, right? <laughs> and Rob, Rob kind of jerked his face out of there and, and leaned <laughs> forward, and Dad hit him with that punch right in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Rob went down, boy, like he was trying to vomit. <laughs> it was like, oh, boy, geez. And Corsica Jean's like, oh, that's what I told you. Don't come here, buddy. You need to go. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, we tried trained by Corsica Jean, who was a hell of a guy. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was a great guy. And uh, so uh, so then I spent the first six months working in the Georgia Territory. That was full of some tremendous stars, Gerald. Uh, Nick Bockwinkel was on top. Uh, that's how good the talent was. Wow. I mean, it was just loaded. The assassins, uh, Jody Hamilton, and Tom Ernesto, right. the original assassins. Uh, it was just a Bobby great, Shane. great minds there to learn from. Oh, minds. Yeah. Oh, yes. And Bobby Shane. Uh, it was at Ray, Ray Gunkel and Dad was the top teams. Uh, it was a, just a loaded territory. Bob Armstrong was uh, in his rookie year. Uh, just really, really great. And then uh, so I spent that first six months there, and then I went to Florida. Um, and uh, stayed well, in as you talk about Florida, that Eddie Graham, I'm Eddie Darsberg. Did you guys train Eddie and break him into the business, or I don't know about that. Now it could have been that could be possible. Uh, he was from Chattanooga. <laughs> Yeah, but he, he built himself from Dardenburg. Yeah, that. but he was from Chattanooga, and I don't doubt that him and Dad had a lifelong friendship. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they were. Yeah, and, I, and I'm pretty sure that that's a, that's a good possibility. I never asked Eddie about that, but uh, he would have got that Charlie Carr train if he right. had had have gone there. That's for darn sure. But uh, Eddie was a Eddie was a wow! What a 
iconic figure. Uh, I mean, he's, he was everything. He was everything I wanted to be as a as a wrestling promoter and and as an owner and as a wrestler and as a human being. He was just he was he was phenomenal. He was a phenomenal person. Very generous person. A lot of people don't realize too. But, you know, but boys it, ranch, boys ranch. ranch. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, he just he and he he was one that early figured out you got to get back to the community that that you're taking from, and, and that was Eddie. That was Eddie's creed all the time down there. You give back, guys. You're here. You you become good citizens, and that was Eddie. That's how Eddie Eddie believed. And he earned that respect, and he had that respect. Yes, too. yes he did. No, uh, I, I saw some phenomenal things there, and uh, your brother was one of them. I'll tell you this one. Uh, was Jack just getting here when you started? Uh, Jack was on top. He was he already had, on top. He, he had, had been he there a couple years. On top, but he was just on top. It was probably about a year after the, Eddie had the accident where the window fell out. And, right. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and God blinded him, again, you know. Right. Uh, so uh, yeah, and Jack was on top, and uh, uh, wow, uh, they we we had the old. Uh, that was during the time frame of what the old snake did. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, the auditorium, the old uh, the sportatorium was the snake pit. And right. I, I saw so many guys, so many marks come in there and leave running and bloody and. And, who, was know, the, who was Eddie's policeman at that time? Was it Roop or the Roop or was that before Roop even? There, was Roop it? was there every day. Me and Roop and uh, Matt Suda was there. Hero was there. And uh, then Jack would come a whole lot of times. Uh, Jack was so far beyond our, where I was or where Roop was. Roop had been in the Olympics too. Uh, had, had been an Olympic but, a wrestler, but uh, uh, he couldn't touch Jack, you no. know, and, None of them could touch Jack, as a matter of fact. And, uh, so, you know, uh, so the, something happened there that uh, that had, that was real bad press that uh, Eddie didn't like, you know. So, and I think it had to do with uh, Root maybe one day. Uh, <laughs> one day this guy came in, he brought his wife. And uh, he said, uh, he said, I want to be a wrestler. And uh, like like a lot of these, and, and and there were so many of these marks that were coming in there wanting to wrestle that you usually had to make an appointment. This guy didn't have an appointment. And make an said, appointment to get your ass kicked. Had to get an appointment to get killed. <laughs> yeah, you, you really wanted this is something you really need, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put me down for the second Tuesday. <laughs> there you go. So uh, so, uh, so uh, this guy shows up and he's got his wife and. Uh, and he comes in through the old door where all the fans came in, that part of the arena door. Right. Yep. And he just kind of shows up out of nowhere. And he says, I, I want to wrestle. And, uh, you know, I, I want to learn to be a wrestler. And, I, and I, I'm pretty damn good. And uh, it wasn't even a real big guy, you know. And uh, and and I looked at his wife. And me, it was me and and, and Roop and uh, Matsuda. And there was a couple of other guys who was in there that day. And his wife was chewing gum. She was she was looking off like she was bored. Uh, well, I'm finally here. He's been talking about it, and I'm finally here. One of those. Days. So, uh, so we told the guy, we go here. We go back in the dressing room there and put your gear on and come on out. And uh, so you know, and Eddie was there. And so Eddie says, uh, Eddie used to pick the guy that was going to get to shoot. You know, and he, you got your day, and it was Roop's day. And he said, Okay, Bob, uh, this one's yours. And uh, so when the guy came out, you'll love this. He had a hood on. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh and, uh, and, and we looked at me and, and met suit at each other like, oh, God, <laughs> this ain't good. <laughs> <laughs> so Eddie uh, says to him, uh, I think you need to pull that off. You're going to need that. <laughs> and, uh, so he got in and, uh, and Matt suit I mean, uh, and, and Bob took, took charge, you know. Oh God! He he suplexed this guy. He bellied to back this guy, um, uh, Gerald. Imagine this: he he reached down real low and he hooked the guy around the waist, right? And they're belly to belly, right? And then he just went straight back as hard as he could, so that the first thing that hit the mat was the guy's face, right? <laughs> face and the upper body. 
And then he came all the way you know, in route pretty heavy, about right. 300 pounds, right? And then he bridged and came all the way over on top of him so that he bent this guy backwards in the way your body don't go, right? And the, the noise, the sound was like, oh, it was like I thought it killed him. Me and Matt Suda thought it killed him. You know, he can't get up. He won't get up from that. And uh, so uh, he, uh, he ended up rolling over to the side. And Eddie, as he always did, he wouldn't let him go. He wouldn't let these marks go until he felt like I don't. I, to me, that was the nuff. You know, Eddie. That's, he, that was it. Eddie said, "Oh, he got him over, pat him on. Oh, it's so you're all right. Come on, you okay? Yeah, you're all right. I remember that. You're all right. You're all right. Get back in there, right? You you can do better. You know. And uh, and I can't remember what Root did to him then, but uh, uh, then he started. Then the guy rolled out of the ring. Uh, the second one was enough, and they had the door still open where he came in, right? His wife's sitting in the front row. She's chewing gum. She watches. <laughs> she's still. I don't care. You know, uh, you know, I, I yeah, kill him. I don't care. Right. You no know, telling what he did. She, she had heard him say that he was going to do. Right? It was one of those deals. Yeah. And so, uh, so the second time he rolls out of the ring and he starts to run. And, uh, and he gets to the door, and Eddie grabs him from behind. And Eddie, oh, Eddie goes to work on him. And, wow, Eddie was so, he was so violent. Uh, I'd never seen anybody like, the first time I ever saw him do that routine on, on somebody, uh, I, I was standing there with about four of us, and Eddie is putting the boots to this guy and just beating his brains out. And, and I said, I, I, somebody got to do something. And I stepped up like I was going to grab him, and uh, and and Rube grabbed me, and he goes, "No, no, no! Don't touch him! Don't touch him! You know, like you don't want to get hold of him now, now." Right? And uh, so uh, you know, then so so he gets this guy, and he goes to work on him. I mean, wow! His wife don't never get out of the chair. She turns her head and watches over there. <laughs> <laughs> Till they come, he thinks it's the work. You know, like, well, this ain't real. He can't be hurting him. And, uh, and then the guy gets loose, and he runs on out the door, and he starts down the street. I walked out there to see. He was running down. He went to the left when he went out of the exportatorium rather than the right, right. toward the main street, toward that neighborhood. Yeah. And he was, he was all hobbling. He was bent over like he, his right <laughs> leg was all down. He, he couldn't run, really, right? He was just, <laughs> and he had a busted eye. It was so <laughs> so we, we <laughs> I go back into the place and we're kind of giggling about it, you know. Oh, girl, this is a funny one, and uh, and and we his wife gets up and she goes up. Uh, well, I guess I better get his clothes. <laughs> go get his clothes. So in a minute now, uh, no, no, we're still kind of giggling and laughing about it, and the cops car comes. The cop comes. And they, they circle around the main street up there, and they come and they park right in front of this, right in front of the deal. And we're all in a little car. And Charlie, Charlie is a little uh, first oh, room sure. yeah. office, okay. And uh, he made his thing, right? We're all right. kind of giggling and laughing about it. And uh, and the cop, man, he said, opens the door and he goes, uh, Eddie. He, said, he knew he knew everybody, you know, and everybody yeah. kind of knew what was going on there, right? Uh. You know, and he says, uh, Eddie, uh, can, can you come out here for a minute? And uh, so, so Eddie, Eddie steps out there. And uh, we do, too. I go, hey, we all go out there and see what's going on. And I look, and there's the guy sitting in the back seat of the cop car. He's all bloody. He's so still bleeding. He's all, he's all kind of sitting in the middle of the seat. And then he looks over, and Eddie looks in the window at him. And then he jumps over to the far side of the car. <laughs> I don't blame him. <laughs> no, no, no. No, like, no, no, don't let him go. Don't let him get no more right. <laughs> so, uh, the cop says to Eddie, he goes, uh, uh, Eddie, uh, uh, did, uh, did, did you do this? And uh, <laughs> Eddie goes, uh, yeah. And <laughs> he goes, <laughs> and the cop went over and he grabbed, opened the car door. And he reaches in and he grabbed the dude and he jerked him out on the sidewalk. And he said, get your ass out of here, boy. <laughs> he was running off down the sidewalk again, just like he did before, man. <laughs> so, boy, there, man. <laughs>
crazy place, man. That's cool. that snake pit was a real experience. Uh, <laughs> so, Ron, your your career was was kind of quick. Uh, did you realize that you wanted to be in promotional business and the wrestling? You know, you 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 were a star nationwide and and a very accomplished wrestler with a, with a lot of championships, as John said in the beginning. But your career was was basically pretty short. You got into promotional business. Was there a reason why? Was there an injury or what? What happened? Well, I, you know, Jerry, I kind of I, I always wanted to be a promoter. I always wanted to be what my granddad and my father had been, and uh, and 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 you know, like everybody else, that that's the man that makes the most money, right? Yeah, right. Yep. You know, and I, and my, you learn that at an early age too. <laughs> yeah, I found out pretty early, you know, that hey, uh, you know, I'm doing all right here, but I could do a lot better if I own own company, you know. So, uh, so I really kind of set my sights on that pretty early in the career. And I was doing really good back in that time frame, 73, 74. Uh, uh, in fact, Sam Mutsey kind of fell in love with me. He booked me. He, I worked St. Louis every Friday night for two years, just about. Uh, and, and it's the same way Jack got, uh, you know, Jack uh, kind of got his uh, start in St. Louis. Right. Oh, uh, he made himself a name there. Yeah, national national star. Absolutely, and uh, you know, bang along came the belt after that. And I kind of, you know, I felt like maybe they were, you know, kind of thinking about maybe doing something in that range. But uh, I, w I always wanted to be a promoter. So uh, after about four years there, and I had the opportunity. I was really lucky. Uh, uh, Eddie took me and said, "Ron, we're going to open West Palm Beach. You got a brand new." auditorium there uh, and want you to be the promoter, the local promoter. Gave me an opportunity to wet my hands and learn how it's all done, uh, which was really great for me. I really appreciated it. And uh, so I took that opportunity. So I spent four years in the territory and then I took my first vacation in four years and I took my wife and my two kids to uh, Smoky Mountains. To Knoxville. I said, I want to see the Smoky Mountains. And, uh, and I did see the Smoky Mountains. And the last day we were there, I fell in love with the beautiful countryside. And then the last day I was there, about 6 o'clock, uh, wrestling came on TV. And uh, it was John Kazana's wrestling show. And uh, I watched it, Jerry, and I was like, oh, my God. I said to myself, uh, how do they draw anything? I thought it was the worst thing I had ever seen. You know, uh, the commentator was a big old guy that wanted to be the star of the show. And uh, every time somebody threw a punch, his favorite saying was, oh, there it is, another warp your head off hole. Another warp your head off hole. Another one, another one. I mean, I was like, oh, my goodness gracious, man. And you just come from perhaps the greatest production oh, state in the world. <laughs> Right? I, there's Gordon Soli and the best television, the best promotion in all the country and all the world, right? And I, I said to myself, wow, if I could get hold of this and I could make a TV like they have in Florida and, uh, and do it right, this might be a good deal for me, you know? Uh, I, and I, and I, I really thought about, you know, if I get to be world champion, there's a lot of travel. That's a hard life, man. I'm sure Jack told you a lot about it. He told me stories about it too. You know, it's it's it was it was a tough deal. So I, I kind of uh I kind of uh, said, hey, uh, who owns it? In fact, uh, I when I got back to Florida, one of my first questions to Charlie Lay and the guys up front there, I said, uh, who owns Knoxville, Tennessee? And they said a guy named Nick uh, Nick Santa, uh, John John Kazan. You know, so. I started talking to him, and bang, man, uh, a month later, I, I owned the territory. Wow. <laughs> and I what, knew nothing. What does that, that consist of, Ron? Huh? What did that consist of when you bought the territory? What What were you buying when you, okay, you know, there, what do you buy when you buy a wrestling promotion? You buy a ring and a truck? and. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what I did is, uh, and I went to see him, and we, we took, uh, we spent some time together. Uh, we took a boat ride. He had the most unusual boat. It had a it had an accordion and and a big uh, uh, orc orc a big orc. You know, uh, wow! It, it it played music. His boat 
went down the Tennessee River and it played music all the way. And the beautiful, oh, what the site was fantastic. I fell in love for sure. I, I was. I, <laughs> you wanted to be there. So I said, "What you know? What do you want for this? What do you want for it?" Uh, and he he said, uh, "He said I take one hundred fifty thousand dollars." So uh, I said, uh, "God and Jerry, I didn't have that kind of money, man." And so I said, uh, uh, "How about uh, I I'd take I do the one hundred fifty, but would you take twenty five thousand down?" And uh, he said. Uh, Thought about it for a minute. He said, yeah, I'll take 25000 down. How are you going to pay me the rest of it? I said, 500 a week. Pay 500 a week until it's all paid off. And uh, so that was the deal. That was the deal we made. Uh, I didn't have the money, Jerry. This is another story. And, uh, and, and in the great one away, you know Mac? You remember Mac, the referee? Oh, yeah, Mac. Uh, Mac yeah. McMurray, yeah. Mac McMurray. Mac McMurray loaned me the money. Wow. Mike on payment. Where the hell did I get that kind of money? Because his father had given him some stock when his father, just before, when his father died. And uh, he had never cashed in the stock. And he was, he he had started helping me with promoting West Palm. Got to be a great friend. Right. Yeah. And then he said, uh, I want a re referee. And I said, I don't think so, Mike. I don't think uh, Eddie's going to go for it. I don't think you know, and then when I came to him, I didn't go to him I, and I didn't go to my dad because I knew my dad would turn me down. And uh, and, and uh, so I didn't want to go through that. So I went to finally I just uh, told Mac I'd kind of given up on it. I said, we were conversating, talking and, uh, you know, I said, Mac, uh, you know, I could I could buy a Knoxville, Tennessee. If I had twenty five thousand dollars. I don't have that kind of money. And uh, he says, Ron, uh, I do. And he goes, if you if you'll take my money and use it and take me with you and make me a referee, let me be spend the rest of my life in this business. He goes, I'll be it, you'll be doing me a favor. And uh, that's where I got my down payment. Wow, from Mac McMurphy, crazy, crazy, and uh, and he refereed from then on. Yeah. He stayed all the way his entire life in the business. Had a good one too. A great referee and a great guy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Great Out, outstanding guy, yeah. yeah well, why do you think your dad would have turned you down? Uh, well, he might not have, to be quite honest with you, John. But I <laughs> felt like I was – I, I he would have been the last guy I would have talked to, you know, because uh, I – Maybe I had a little same relationship with me, with my dad, as he had with his dad. You know, I, I think that's a little bit of the case. You and know? your dad probably would. He probably would have come around, but he would have made you. He would have made you jump through some hoops. Oh <laughs> yeah, sure he would. Have. And if it hadn't worked out, I don't know what I could have done then. I would have. Our relationship. Was, was he good. upset when you bought the territory, or did you had? It was a what? Were you, was he upset with you when you when you finally got the money and bought the territory, or did he cooperate with you then? Uh, you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he you know he he was a uh, supportive, but uh, you know he didn't he didn't uh, he didn't he I don't think he thought I, I was going to make it, you know. And and I tell you what, Jerry, the first year I I didn't think I was. Gonna make it. You know, I mean, I found out I thought I knew how to promote, but I realized. Uh, when I got there and actually got involved and started working on things that, hey, I, I, I'm in over my head, yeah. you know. Right. Uh, and I found out there were things that I didn't talk to Kazana about that I should have. I did not know that uh, he got all of his talent, most of it, except for Ron Wright and local guys, from the Nashville office, and he paid him 10% booking off the top. And uh, – so you couldn't have his own talent, and uh, if there were some things that I that I that I later found out that really really made it difficult for me. And I had to go to my granddad and tell him. I said, you know, I'm, after a month of running the town and what Nick was doing, you familiar with Nick Goulas's booking? Yeah. Nick was booking these guys, and then half of them wouldn't show up, and you advertise them. They're on the card, they're on the TV, you advertise, and then they don't show. And you substitute, you ain't prepared to substitute. You shouldn't have to substitute if you're paying 10%, right? 
They should get everybody. You advertised. should get everybody advertised. Yeah. You should bust your ass to get it done, right? And uh, so I went through about a month of, uh, of all these substitutions and seeing that this is going to kill me. And I, and I called up my granddad and I said, Roy, uh, I know what the deal's been. I know you've been doing this deal with John Kazana for 20 years. And I said, but uh, I can't do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to get my own talent. And I'm not going to depend on you and your guys from your office. And uh, he asked me what happened. I told him what Nick had been doing. He did. He wasn't aware of it. He said, I'll take care of it. And I said, no, I'll take care of it. I'm not going to pay you booking anymore. It's all right. It's over. And uh, I'm going to run my own company over here. And, uh, and he said, he thought about it. And then he said, good luck to you, boy. You know, and uh and uh, so I started getting my own talent. And uh, what were you running besides Knoxville? I was running originally Knoxville and uh, Johnson City. And Johnson City was uh, Roy's secretary, Christine's town. Right. That was her town. So uh, I worked out a deal with them. I said, I need another town. Yeah, Christine, that's that's one of the Jarrett's. Uh, yeah, Christine's mom. Christine, that's Jared, okay. Jared, okay. Christine. Christine. Own, I don't know how Christine got to own in Johnson City, Kingsport, Tri Cities up there, three cities up there. So I got that. Uh, I worked a deal with her and Jerry to where uh, we split the profit. I ran the town. I did. They I put my TV in there, and uh, they didn't have to send people to Johnson. How did City. you get your TV? Did you have to barter for your TV? Pay for your TV, or how did how did you get that? It was a barter deal, but that's a good story there. Uh, a TV station that I had when I bought it was horrible. It sat on top of a mountain. It had a signal that only got out about 30 miles from Knoxville. It basically, I didn't have anything but Knoxville. You know, I ran, Marstown was about 30, 30 minutes away. And uh, it was uh, on a Saturday night, Knoxville Friday, Saturday night. Then I finally started getting to run some Tuesday. But what I did, and I had that commentator. That it's a warp your head off, old time. <laughs> Where did they get this guy? Because there, there's always these guys in different yeah. territories that are just awful. <laughs> where, uh, where did they get him? Oh, the, he and here's the bad part about it is he worked for the TV station, right? <laughs> so he got he, he, he was a kind of because back in the day, if, if they the TV had stations, they yeah. like John said, they were ever. They would push those guys off on the wrestling. Uh, some of them are horrible. I mean, horrible. horrible up there. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they want to be there, but they had to go yeah. there. Yeah, I was in a situation to where you know, if, if I can't go fire this guy because he's going to maybe get me kicked off the TV if that were to happen. So uh, I went to, I went to the big station. I went to the biggest station in Knoxville, Channel Ten, uh, and I had been in business for two months, and uh, and I went in there and I got a meeting with the. Uh, general manager and the salesman. And I, I sat down with those guys and I, I told them my background, where I've been, I told them my family's background. Uh, I, and I said, uh, guys, I got to tell you, uh, I think the wrestling show that I have now stinks. It's hard. And I go, I don't want just hillbilly fans. I don't want that type of commentator. Uh, I want to do what they do in Florida, and uh, and uh, and the guy says uh, to me, uh, "What is that?" And Jerry, I'd done my homework, and I had a damn tape, and I said, "Here's what I want," and I dropped it on the table. We were in a big conference room. They had a, a VCR there. He popped it in the machine, and uh, we watched 15 minutes of it. And the guy looked at me and he says, "Can you do that? Can you give us that?" And I said, I'm going to do my damn level best to do it. I said, first of all, the, the whoop your head off, old guy's gone. I said, they, <laughs> it won't be that type of commentator that has my show. And I got hired Les Thatcher, who was great for it, perfect for it. And uh, and within 15, within probably 30, 45 minutes, I had a deal to move from the worst station in the city to the one that had a signal that went 150 miles in the so it gave me a territory. All of a sudden, instead of having a town, I had a territory. Because I had all these towns I was going to be able to run that had a lot of them never been run. 
So uh, it just it took off, man. Wow. Uh, I tell you, we had a. This you probably will. Some people don't really believe this sometimes. So I tell it. Two years after we were on that television station, we had an eighty shoot. Wow. Wow. Eighty shoot. It, they that TV station we, we st- I went on there. They was charging fifty dollars a spot. Uh, two years later, they were three hundred a spot, and you had to wait. They had a waiting list. So you were you were making the station all kinds of money. So they they would love to. It were it was unbelievable. We beat Tennessee football. Wow! It, it, was, it was unbelievable. They couldn't believe it themselves. They were like God. Run. They they treated me like God. You know, I mean, they were like, geez, when we got the, when the rating books came in, uh, they, they'd call me up and say, Ron, come on down. It was almost like a party. Then the conference table was full. The sales manager, the GM, they were all there. Look at this, Ron. That's an 80 shit. Four out of five homes in this city, in this part of the country, watching this shit. Wow. Like, wow. That's pretty good, isn't it, guys? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I mean, we rocked it then, and then I started getting some great talent. Uh, wow, I had some of the greatest talent, Jerry. I, had, I was so lucky. I had a lot of the old Florida boys, the young guys uh, that ended up there, uh, Dick Slater, and uh, wow, just one after another after another. Bob Roop was end up there. Uh, Ronnie Garvin end up there, uh, Joe LaDuke, uh, the Mongolian Stomper. When a guy like Stomper came there in that part of the country, oh, people had never yeah. seen that. You can just imagine what that happened. Oh, yeah, yeah. Overnight. And then we did these crazy angles. We 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 did some things that had never been done before. And uh were you, know, you we, okay, were you were you doing a book or did you have somebody helping you? Uh Rob. Me and Rob was doing the book. Yeah. I brought my brother in. We sat down. We talked about what we we're going to do, and we cracked into it. Uh, we had, and, and you what, guys were coming along just at the right time because of the youth movement. And you know, you were you were still young, and your brother, of course, was, was young. So you had that young, good-looking, fresh talent in that that they weren't used to seeing that up in the up in the mountains of Tennessee. No. And, and you know, and I changed the whole demic. Uh, you know, they they had had the Ron Wright type of deal. You know, they, there was no wrestling and all fighting and blood and all that. Uh, first guy I brought in was Dale Lewis. I kept Dale Lewis for six months, and I put a thousand dollar bill on his lapel every television show, and every night in every town, he said, "I'll take any challenges. You beat me, I'll give you this thousand dollar bill." They were lined up every night, and we turned really? that territory. We turned that territory in six months from a blood and guts to a wrestling territory. I'll tell you, fans watched that sucker man, and they were like, "Wow, this is crazy, man." I can't believe he can do that, you know? So, uh, and then after that came Danny Hodge and I just crammed it, wrestling down their throats and uh, changed the whole perspective, changed everything about it. And those, that television station people, they were watching that too. And they were going, he's giving us wrestling. He's giving us what he said he was going to do. And, uh, and it just caught on. Then we were, had opportunity to get some great guys. Uh, once it started growing, it was the greatest little territory there ever was. You, nobody was home after midnight for any show. You do six, six nights a week, and your longest trip was 110 miles. Wow. Look, who could compete with that? And they and, were making uh, money, too. <laughs> guys were making 1000 a week. Yeah, uh, as Jerry said earlier, one of the cool things we're going to do with these, Ron, is do some research on some people that, you know, we we know, but you learn so much more about them. Kevin Sullivan was one of the interviews I saw about you, about talking about what a great payoff you were. And uh, you you were famous for that, how, how you took care of the boys. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, obviously you had to do that. I mean, I, I realized that, uh, that uh, I haven't been working for myself for a long, long time, uh, that uh, – I had a great advantage with the size of my territory, and I figured that if I paid really well, I was going to get anybody I wanted. Well, and- Ron, you, you you actually changed the perception uh, uh, to go along with John's question. You changed the perception of Tennessee wrestling because 
the reputation of Tennessee wrestling was Nick Goulas. And I know your, your uncle was, was, was with Nick, but Nick was the, the figurehead. Nick was in charge. And Nick, Nick was notorious for screwing guys out of money. So just the kind of, even though it was Nashville, the connotation, you go to Tennessee, you're going to work at Nick Goulas, you're going to starve to death. I mean, Nick nearly ran my brother out of the business before he even started. And you had to, you had to go in and change the entire perception to get guys to come to your territory. And the way to do that was like you were doing it, was paying the guys good money. Talking about that, the Jack and I, one time I talked about that to Jack. And I one time we had a conversation. I said, Jack, did you ever work in Nashville for Nick Goulas? And he goes, because, you know, Jack was kind of silent for a little bit. He goes, yeah, I did, Bob. And uh, I said, how did that go? And he said, uh, he said, I, I rode in in a Cadillac. And I went out on the ground. Yeah, he did. <laughs> I, that damn boulder fell off the side of the mountain and crushed his car. <laughs> <laughs> and Nick would give him the money to leave. And, and one of the guys there loaned him 25 bucks to buy a bus ticket from Nashville or to, uh, to Oklahoma City. I thought he was kidding about that, Joe. <laughs> no, that was a true story. <laughs> I thought that wasn't true. That was uh, true. That was a true story. He and he'd come home. He was going. He was. He was going to start teaching and coaching wrestling. And uh, and uh, McGurk got a hold of him. And said, "Hey, I'll send you down to down to down to Fritz. Fritz will make you some money down there." So he went down to, to Dallas. There for me. I'll be darn, man. I kind of thought that was a joke. <laughs> oh, that was. Uh, that was that, that, I mean, we almost lost Jack Briscoe in his first year of the business because of the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell you. Uh, so that's, you know, basically that's what we did, uh, you know, and uh, Rob did a great job of booking. Uh, then uh, in 1978, I bought a second territory. We were doing so well. Uh, God, we were selling out the Coliseum. We have the all-time record. In 1977, I wrestled Harley Race in uh, Knoxville Coliseum. And it, to still this day, 44, 46, eight, eight years ago, uh, we still have the record for sports event, the biggest crowd ever in the sports event in that building. And, uh, and we just, we started selling out and we sold out again and again and again. Uh, talent got better and better and better. Uh, 1978, I said, I can so do this. The expansion was on the horizon. So you looked south to the panhandle of Florida. Was, I was really, who, who was running the, who was running the panhandle? The, the Fields brothers still down there. They bought dad out in 58. They were still down there. But first I looked north to Ohio because the sheep was in trouble. Right. And I right. wanted to, I wanted, I looked at those big massive cities up there. Yeah. And if I hadn't have been a, son, a country boy and I hated the damn cold weather, I would have <laughs> probably took the Ohio run. Yeah. But uh, I looked down south and there was Pensacola on the beach. And I said, yeah. wow. On the you beach, know, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to go south. So uh, I bought the Fields Brothers out. And their territory was dead, so dead that they had sold it to Jim Barnett in the Georgia and uh, Fred Ward out of Georgia uh, before I bought it. And, uh, and it, it just it went. They did nothing, basically. Uh, they couldn't make it go. And uh, so uh, uh, they gave it back to the Fields Brothers. <laughs> they, gave, <laughs> they gave it back. <laughs> they said, Take it. We don't, and no, you can have it back. We don't want it. And uh, so I got in touch with them, and then I came down and started down there. And I took Bob and me and uh, David Schultz was young. Here's another one of those young stars. Uh, David Schultz, and Mike Stallings. It was Jerry Stubbs, Mr. Olympia. Uh, I took all these young stars, these scratchers and diggers, and I was grinding them, say, boys, let's get this territory rocking. And uh, it was so bad, girl, that we gave the money back for the first two shows in Montgomery, Alabama, example. We didn't have enough people to, to run the show. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, but I, and the guys would go, wow, Ron, how are we going to do this? I said, we're going to do it. We're going to make it happen just like we made it happen in Knoxville. And uh, we were lucky enough, man, to hang in there. And, uh, wow, within a year, we were drawing 10,000 people in Mobile oh. in one town. I mean, it was just, uh, we, we lit it up. Yeah. We got and really then, then as, and most successful stories, a, 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 a problem arises, and a problem arises within your your own territory uh, up north, where you're focusing on building the uh, the southern end. Uh, 
and this is this is where it really gets interesting to me. Uh, uh, a guy, a five group of four or five guys decide, you know, you're not treating them right. And and Ron, I mean, I I can testify to this, John. The rumor was that Ron Ron was probably the best payoff guy in the United States at this time. And then he guys started complaining, I don't, I'm not getting the money uh, that I'm supposed to be getting. So there was a plan to, uh, 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 they come up with called a Plan B. Can you tell us a little bit about the Plan B? What happened? Yeah. Uh, you know, let's start just a little bit about how all that kind of got started in a way. Uh, uh, at 1978, I bought the territory down there and uh, on the Gulf Coast. And uh, then I went south. And I didn't come back to work in Knoxville hardly at all in 78 and on into almost 79. And uh, so uh, I, it was Rob's turn to go south into uh, uh, Gulf Coast. And uh, I wanted to give myself a rest. And I hired Bob Root to book the territory. Uh, and I hadn't, hadn't seen Bob Roop in four or five years uh, before I hired him. I had no idea of what his history was. I just assumed he was the same Bob Roop that I'd been in snake pit with all those years. And, uh, and then I found out, no, he's far from that. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, Bob Roop had already tried to steal a territory from Roy Shires in California, San Francisco. Uh, so I took, I went in and uh, uh, Roop, uh, I let Roop run the territory and me taking some time off because I had worked double time trying to build two territories at once, keep one running and build another. Anyway, uh, 1979, about May of 1979, all of a sudden, uh, uh, Ronnie Garvin, my top baby face, uh, Malenko, one of my top uh, baby faces, I mean, my top heel at the time. Uh, Bob Root, top heel. Uh, Bob Orton Jr., one of the top heels. Uh, Ron Wright. And uh, they all uh, decided that, like I said, I guess. And they tried to talk the entire, everybody in the territory into going with them. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, they, and they said that uh, that was the rumor I got to. I really didn't know what the deal was. You know, what's, what's wrong here? What's, what's the problem? Uh, I had a meeting with Root, and he said, Ron, uh, uh, we think somebody's stealing money. You know, I mean, and I, and McMurray was in charge of running the towns, honest guys you could possibly have, and had been there all those years. And I, and I said, uh, and you think Mac McMurray is run stealing money from me? And uh, I said, the Coliseum sells all the tickets; they can't be stealing money in the big town. And I said, the small towns is run by Mac. And uh, so uh, he says, yeah, and, and, you know, the guys aren't making as much money as they used to. And uh, now I'm in this, I have a stud case uh, that uh, I, I'm in this time frame where, where these guys are complaining that the money wasn't good. Well, I found out that when I started getting, going back and looking at my figures, the town territory went down. Once Bob Root got the book, the territory started going down. And, uh, and uh, obviously they weren't making money that they wanted to make. So anyway, they decide that they're going to open up their own thing. They went back to the same TV station on the top of the mountain. They went back and got the same commentator. The war <laughs> <laughs> and They went in business against against me. And uh, and we battled there for about six months. Uh, and and what happened? Uh, it that happens in most. But wrestling wars, right, Gerald? Uh, it, it killed the territory. It killed the town. You know, uh, fans don't understand the war. You know, uh, they just uh, they they go, "What is going on here?" And uh, once they get confused, who do I support? Do I go to this one? Do You're I make them make a choice at that time? They got to make a choice, and uh, and it was a horrible situation. I knew it was going to be, but it was even worse than I thought because. They didn't just allow me to run my operation and continue on and them go in and run an operation and continue. They tried to uh, uh, undermine my my company by uh, doing these crazy things like, will we challenge so-and-so over there to come over to our place and beat us on Saturday night? Hey, what do we, why would we go over and draw you a crowd, right? I mean, uh, you know, just stupid things like that. And, uh, so it, uh, they basically, I sold out. 
I kept that uh, territory until the fall of 1979. Uh, I got in touch with Jim Barnett, personal friend of me and my father. And I wrestled for him in Australia in 1973. And uh, I, I, I sold it to Jim Barnett and Fred Ward. And uh, for the same amount I paid for, it, same dollars, 150 <laughs> uh, And But it, it was a multi-million dollar business. It, it was worth a hell of a lot of money if it hadn't been for the, uh, for having the, uh, the opposition, you know? So, uh, and, uh, yeah. And then you talking about the plan B. Uh, yeah. The, the, the video did, were you aware of any of that? Obviously you weren't. And, uh, no, no, uh, you know, you know, our business, nothing is kept a secret for very long. And, uh, and that's the surprising thing. I mean, the five prominent guys in your territory had got together and, Threatened it. Well, not only threatened, they put it on tape about exposing the business. And fortunately, it didn't play during that time. But none of those guys ever said a word, I guess, from one one guy that knew it was aware of that wasn't on the tape, I guess, came forward and, and informed you what was going on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, I had no idea. I had no idea they ever made a tape like that. I'm sure they waited until about the time I sold out. And maybe my selling out is what forced them, forced their hand. Uh, they Now they got Barnett coming in there, uh, and they didn't know what to expect from that. Uh, they weren't drawn. They, did, they, they weren't successful at all. Uh, and they spent a lot of their own money, undoubtedly. There's no doubt about that. You were never threatened uh, that they were going to expose the business or anything. I, I, that's that's what we find a hard time, you know, understanding why they make a safe if they never showed it and they, they just buried it somewhere. They, you know, I I, I was I, they, I got all kinds of threats, you know, and uh, about you know don't be out in the nightclubs and don't do this and don't do that and you know and we're, we're gonna we're gonna expose the business, you know, and I I thought that was totally you know. These guys, they, how, you, how, you didn't do that back in those days. <laughs> you don't make a living after you do that, you know, right? I mean, who's going to take you and use who's you? Who's going to book you? Yeah, yeah, who's going to book you? So, uh, no, I just it didn't make any sense to me. I had no idea. I spent all those years from uh, 1979 until about uh, three years ago. Uh, I got a call from a uh, from a person on social media that said, uh, Ron. Have you ever seen this tape? Uh, and I said, what tape are you talking about? The plan B tape. And I, well, what is a plan B tape? It, it was, it was, and he named off Bob Ruth, uh, Ron Wright, uh, uh, Bob Orton, Malenko, Garvin. Uh, they all off the business. They, they out of the business. They, they broke k Fabe. And I, uh, I said, are you serious? Man, you can't be serious, man. And he goes, I send you the tape. Send you a copy. And uh, I got the tape, and I was like, oh, my God. My first thought, Gerald, was what would that have done to wrestling yeah. in 1979 if that had come out, if those guys had used that tape? I don't know why they didn't use it. I don't know why they made it. I mean, why even make it? No, I mean, uh, but uh, I think they were just very disillusioned. I think they really believe, well, we're going to take this territory and it'll be ours. He'll go away. You know, he's got another territory. Maybe they figured, well, he's got another one. He'll just go down there and we'll take it. We'll have it. You know, uh, so I don't know how that, uh, how they, how they uh, handle all that in their heads. And you were really tight with Ron Wright. You, you risked your life getting on an airplane with him. And did, <laughs> did, what, what was your friendship like after, after that? Or do you, did, you didn't know Ron was involved or, or. I had no idea, man, who was involved in it. And obviously they said, talk to everybody in the territory, uh, except, uh, obviously I don't think Jimmy Golden was part of that crew. Obviously they wouldn't have talked to my cousin about it, but. Right. But uh, the guy that did come and tell me finally who it was uh, is a guy that they did talk to, and that was Dick Slater. Yeah. Dick was a really tight with me, and he came to me, and he said, Ron, you're going to have a problem. And, uh, and all the other guys, the Kevin Sullivans and all the other guys, if they didn't stay with me, they left the territory. They wanted no part of it. And, they didn't uh, stay to work for that group. Then. They did not stay. Only those five guys were the only. Did five any of them want to come to work for you and Pensacola? 
Uh, I tell you what, Gerald, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very uh, a forgiving person, man. I, I believe uh, God wants us to forgive, and uh, having uh, grudges and uh, and bad feelings is is not the way I wanted to live. And uh, and I came back. Crazy story. We had this all this huge success in in the Gulf Coast down there. Uh, then in 1985, I decided that uh, I wanted to have the biggest uh, and best television product in America because Vince was getting ready to. I knew Vince was going to be coming, and uh, so I was one of the. I was the. I, th- I believe I was the very first in early 1985. I went to a production company and I can't, I told them to bring your truck to the Boutwell Auditorium, my biggest arena. And we started filming uh, our television shows with Gordon Soley uh, live from Boutwell Auditorium with six, 8,000 people in the building. Uh, it was the very first, I believe, company that uh, started producing shows that way. And uh, I, I saw that coming uh, down the road and I said, we got to compete and we got to do this. When I did that and I got it started, I was able to go back to Knoxville. Knoxville died. Right. Uh, after Barnett got it, he sold it to Ric Flair and uh, Blackjack Mullen. Blackjack. Uh. It died. It totally died. Knoxville was dead for five years. Nobody could draw a dime there. 1985, I got this TV show started again. I went back to Knoxville and I said, how would you like to be back in, uh, in the wrestling business? And the TV station took me right back. They put us on, and we, the first night there, we sold out the Coliseum. We sold out the Coliseum every other week for two years, three years after that. On into 1987, uh, you know, we were just selling it out. And plus, all the way to the Gulf Coast. So basically, I came back and got my old territory for not a penny. Didn't cost me. <laughs> you know, so. That, that, uh, that pl- the, I'm sorry to interrupt you. The, when Jerry told me about this Plan B video, I I couldn't quit watching. I never, I couldn't. It's hard to believe that something like this happened and disappeared for so long. Obviously, it was being going to be used as a threat. Do you think they ever showed it to anybody? You think they ever showed it to Barnett? You think they ever showed it to anybody at all, or just made it and n- decided not to use it? I think it, that's what happened. I think they made it and they decided to, not to use it because they they realized that they weren't going to make it there. And, uh, you know, that they were going to need to continue to wrestle. It's what they did, and now they're going to make the money. And, uh, and I think they decided just to, to go on and uh, deal with it that way. Uh, and the guy that sent it to me was not a wrestler. He was just a fan, but he was from up in that Kingsport area where Ron Wright was from. And uh, he might have been one of the people that recorded it and sat on it for all those years. And, uh, and I think because I've kept doing this stud cast and, and, uh, and I had a lot of people on social media, a lot of fans were loving that story from that, this Knoxville story. He's telling the story of all of it. Right. And, uh, and, uh, he just called me up and said, Ron, you need to see this basically. And I said, send it to me. And I was like, you, I bet I watched it 10 times. I couldn't believe it. I, I watched I watch I it a dozen times before I sent it to John just to make sure it was real. I couldn't believe it. I said, <laughs> you can't quit watching it. Once you start watching it, you can't quit watching it. It's just it's so shocking. And and you you know those guys, Gerald. I mean, you I know, know personally, yeah. All I can say they're all my friends, you know. And I was just holy cow. I mean, the world could could all five of them think that uh, yeah, this is a good idea. Yeah. You know, I think that, they were really, and they were smart, and they're they're intelligent guys. Ronnie's a smart guy. I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and Bob Bob's a, a smart guy, and Bob Orton Jr. will be Bob Orton Jr. <laughs> but uh, you know, those those are some smart guys in that group there. That I just couldn't. I, that's that's the reason I had to watch it so many times myself. It's just <laughs> I can't believe what I'm seeing from the guys I'm hearing this from. It's got to be something going on here, Parky. You know, and uh, you know, then then just being buried for how many years 40 50 years oh, yeah. all of a sudden service and this is going back two years ago but wow i mean it's a still yeah, a shock from 78 to uh probably uh two to two, two, 2000 maybe you know i mean uh two, two, 2020 it just it, it makes no sense and I, and I, you're right how i don't know how anything gets hidden in the rest of the business <laughs> 
Ron, I've told people, I've told a lot of people that this is what needs to be a documentary on. This is what this is what they need to make one of these A and E shows on because this is one of the craziest things that happened in wrestling history that somehow was hidden for several decades over this incredible war that was being fought in Knoxville. It's just a it's a, one of the most interesting stories I've ever heard. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. It's just a. Uh... Yeah, uh, I, I almost fell out of my seat, man, when I, when I put it in and I started. <laughs> I did. I couldn't believe it. I watched about 30 seconds of it and I called Jerry. I said, it's, you got to be kidding me. This is not real. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's, and I agree. I think it would make great, uh, it would make great television and uh, a great documentary. Uh, uh, that whole war was totally different uh, than the Atlanta Wars, as, as an example. You know, I was kind of involved in the Atlanta War. I went work for the NWA group, and uh, uh, and I knew Ann Gunkel and Ray Gunkel were, were partners with Ray was partners with my dad for years and years. And that that uh, opposition there, that competition between these two companies was handled very uh, very uh, uh, legitimately and as it should be. Uh, well, they they, were, they knew who they were facing, and you didn't know who your you didn't know who your enemy was at least they knew who their enemy was and i understand also talking about that 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 you were asked to go in or you you volunteered to go in and talk to ann gunkel to, to ann are you sure you're doing the right thing yeah yeah i did i, I made a trip for my dad eddie uh, to talk to her about it and uh, i couldn't talk her out of it you know but she was far enough along she had her own office at that point that she already had a wrestling office so uh i knew that uh, there probably wasn't going to be much uh much likelihood of it happening, but uh, uh, I really liked uh, Ray Gunkel, and, and and I loved Dan too. They were they were great great people, and uh, uh, wow, it it, it was sh pretty shocking, man. Uh, but the, this one was even more shocking actually for me. Yeah. And then when you you put the Plan B on top of it, wow, <laughs> it is then it's it's something remarkable. Uh, yeah, I mean, what was it supposed to be about? John helping uh, five part series where they were going to cover homosexuality, blood, series, yeah, the and, payoffs, uh, the and, fixing of the matches, the, the whole whole nine yards. And I always, I always, I thought watching it, they were referencing Barnett, you know, because yeah, they I did too. When I when I first heard that, yeah. I thought I that was targeted. Went, that was targeted to Barnett, yeah. and it was, it was because he had at that point taken over from where I was. So he was the man now, and I'm sure they they said, "Hey, we need to go after him." You know, uh, wow! It just uh, an an amazing video, and uh, well, you know, it, it, you know, it, you know what gets me is I watched it on YouTube, and I don't know, I don't know if it's elsewhere on YouTube. It may be somewhere, but it only had a few thousand views. I don't know why it doesn't have a few million views. I wonder I who mean, owns wrestling. that. Who owns that tape, Ron? Do you know who owns the thing? I don't know, but I think uh, it was produced by Ron Wright and uh, and some people did it for him. Uh, I know it was came out of that Kingsport area up there. Uh, Ron Wright's home was Kingsport, uh, and uh, I got a feeling that Ron Wright uh, got in touch with some television people. Could could they, this have been a thing where you know a te television station? Produces a films a tape that uh, produces a tape, and they they, they you know hang on to this thing because you know we don't want to hold on to it. And TV station hangs on to it, and then somebody just randomly going through some old tapes at a TV station. Wow, look what I found! Uh, that could have been, Jerry. That, that could happen. Uh, that that's that could be the way it got out. There needs to be some forensics done on this and figure out because it can't be that hard to find out. You know, you, you find out who posted it, and then you got to just do a little backward trail on there. There's, there needs to be somebody that an yeah. investigative reporter with a little more technical expertise than me and Gerald Briscoe <laughs> <laughs> to find it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that's that's the story of the Wrestling War '79. You know. Uh, Basically, uh, we went back north uh, in 85, uh, and we actually picked up towns when we went through that next time. Uh, Jim Barnett says, Ron, you, your company is fabulous. Your business is tremendous. Uh, we're all kind of suffering here a little bit. Uh, 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 would you like to run Chattanooga? Just give us half the money. We'll give you Chattanooga. So uh, I, I picked up cities that I'd never had, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, you know, I mean, it just it kept going and going, and uh, uh, we we were running everything from uh, 
from the middle of Kentucky to the Gulf of Mexico. Wow. Uh, 85, 86, 87, uh, all the big cities. Uh, 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 it was a, it was a, and, and going home, Gerald, uh, you know, what a, what a great feeling it was to go back into that Knoxville Coliseum after that war oh, yeah. and that, gone for five years. And, uh, and when I booked it, I, I was thinking, and, and I had a couple of people when they said, you going to go back to Knoxville. And I said, yeah, we're going to try it. We're going to try it and see what's there. I know it's been dead. And uh, they all, the you know, all, they all laughed. Oh, okay, Ron. Well, good luck. And uh, by gosh, it was so, you know, what a, what a thrill. Uh, uh, it had to be, yeah. Black to be the back of that Coliseum, back and seeing that son of a gun full. It was like, God mighty, look at this, man. <laughs> wow. They're still Agreed. there. We've come home. That's a great ending. I mean, well, that's a great ending. You were, did any of these guys ever approach you about coming to Bork for you? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, 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 Ron Wright worked for me as soon as I came back to Knoxville. I hired him. I hired him back as a manager, and uh, he worked for me all that time with Continental. Uh, and he even worked for me after Continental closed, and I sold Continental to a television station in Montgomery. Uh, I went to Knoxville and I started my last wrestling club, USA Wrestling, I called it, and uh, and I had him as a manager for me in that club. Yeah. So uh, you know, I hate to, you know, we've gone so long, and I hate to keep you your time here, but you know, I'm not going to let you go until we get the hockey story out of you. Your <laughs> I love this story. Oh, this is, this <laughs> I love is this so, story. This is so fantastic. How you how you turn it? I mean, you basically. It was the father of, of ho Southern hockey in the southern <laughs> part of the United States. There, Nashville Predators kind of derived from from your hockey business. Tell us a little bit, just you know, what you can on how 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 you came up with the idea that I'm going to get in the hockey business now. You know, wrestling business is brutal, but I want to get in the hockey business. Not okay. knowing any, probably never even seen a hockey game before in your life. All right, that's there you go. That's exactly right. I've never seen a live hockey game. I mean, obviously, everybody sees a little piece of stuff on uh, television. And I'd seen a hockey game on TV. And Knoxville had a hockey team in 1980. About 86, they got into the East Coast Hockey League, which was a four-team league. It was Knoxville, uh, Roanoke, Virginia, Erie, Pennsylvania, and uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Okay? Uh, and uh, so... I had a business partner that had been working with me once I went back to Knoxville with Continental, and we he 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 ran USA with me the set my last wrestling company, and then uh, I went to, I said this is it I'm through man I'm I'm I got myself a boat I said I'm gonna enjoy my life I, I, I'm done, and uh, so he I knew they had a hockey team in Knoxville and he he called me up one day and he says Ron uh, why don't we go see one of these hockey games live. Was this a motive that he had to get you involved in it, or did he just out of randomly say, do you want to see a hockey game? He, he wanted – it was a little of both, I got a feeling, <laughs> because uh, we had been we had been successful in the wrestling business once they came back with Continental. So I, I think he thought, hey, man, we, we, we may have some success in this. It's, whatever reason, I, we went. And this is a crazy story. Uh, we watched the first period of the game. In fact, when the game started – the players just kind of uh, suddenly appear on the ice and, uh, you know, buildings about, about got a thousand people in it and, you know, and, uh, and they, they, they're, they're skirting it in the circles and they're shooting the puck and, uh, you know, it's like no intro, no nothing, uh, you know, and then uh, they blow the whistle and then they get everybody, the game kind of starts and, you know, uh, we'll watch the first period. Uh, nothing happens. People sit on their hands. And, uh, and I told Bob, Bob Pope is my buddy's name. And I said, Bob, I said, uh, I think, wow, this is, this. <laughs> I thought, you know, this ain't much, you know. And uh, and we were about at the end of the very first period. And uh, two guys dropped their gloves. And they heard fight start, right? Building stood up. And, and I looked at him again, man, and I said, whoa. Well, I can identify with this part of it. <laughs> You know, I said, there may be something in this, you know. Uh, and so we watched another period, had another fight. And I was like, whoa, I see the high spot. 
I mean, hey, there's a high spot in this. You know, we can, sometimes you can get them, right? And uh, so, uh, so we left the seats and we went into the Coliseum office because I'd done business there for years and years with the Coliseum. They all knew me. And I said, uh, tell me something about this hockey league. You know, and they said, well, there's four teams and then Roanoke is the place. And so me and him, we take a trip to Roanoke, Virginia. We sat down with uh, with the hockey owner, the team, the guy that owns the East Coast Hockey League, which is now by far the biggest hockey league that's ever been. But we we cranked it up. For it. So we go in and sit down and uh, we say, well, how's this work? And finally, uh, what does it cost? $25,000 franchise fee. So – I said, okay, well, hey, hey, let me take a shot. You didn't have to go to Mac this time to borrow the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't have to borrow the money this time. Yeah, I had the money. So, uh, so we paid, we paid the money. And uh, we, uh, so, uh, and, and the last question before we left, he, he says, uh, hey, uh, you're a wrestler, right? And I said, yeah, 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 I'm a wrestler. I used to be a wrestler. He goes, you, uh, you wouldn't, uh, you, if you had a team, you wouldn't have a bunch of goons and a and a and a wrestling type of coach or nothing like that, would you? You know, and I said, uh, no, man, of course not. You know, I mean, uh, this ain't wrestling; it's it's hockey, right? I I, I enjoy the game, but you know, anyway. So that came kind of started the deal. Uh, I got the feeling that the, you know, and that never left the time I, the whole five years I was in this league. Uh, that that was always a little bit of a a little bit of problem. So anyway, we went back and we don't know nothing about hockey. We don't know how to hire a coach. We don't know anything. So the commissioner of the league says, "I'll help you hire a coach." And we and I said, "Just start sending me names and numbers. I'll talk to them." And and uh, so and we're going to start our next season. We'll be running in '89. And so uh, we got out. What we did, Gerald, is we went. To we went – everybody in that league just had a little small-time mind frame. You know, they, they, they didn't cut. They didn't pop, publicize. Uh, they didn't do anything different. It's like, hey, we've got a game here. You can come and see it if you want to. Uh, we went to Nashville with the, um, with the idea of we're, we're going to blow this thing out of the water. Why, not, why Nashville instead of Knoxville? Huh? Why Nashville instead of Knoxville? Knoxville had a team. Oh, Knoxville already had a team. Already had a team. And that's one of the reasons I bought it. I said, we got a rival. We'll be the only damn team in the league that's got a rival 180 miles away. And besides that, Nashville's bigger building is almost twice the size of Knoxville's Coliseum. I said, we got a bigger building, Bob. I said, we sell that sucker out, and we'll be really walking the tall cup. And uh, like, he's like, wow, heck yeah, Ron, let's do Nashville, right? So we go to Nashville, and we name the team the Knights. We have a big press conference. I'm the damn owner, and I dress all up. We've already got the uniforms and the logo, the whole deal. And i uh, got a room full of press, and, uh, and, and I say, anybody got any questions? And every one of them had the same question. They go, how the hell do you ever think you're going to survive here in Nashville? You know, so we had hockey here about 15 years ago, uh, and it died. It's ho- they, this ain't a hockey town. And I was like, I had a press conference, and I'm just – the whole argument is, uh, you ain't going to do shit, boy. You know, what are They're you doing? calling you a dumbass. <laughs> they were all – they thought – they knew I was a dumbass. That's basically <laughs> it. And I'm showing them the jersey and all that, and they're going, you ain't going to make it. How many people – I think one of them said, how many people you think you're going to have for the first game? And uh, I said, uh, I don't know. I said, uh, we haven't even started to promote yet. I said, but uh, we're going to find out. I said, it's going to take us about six months here, and then I'll have the answer to that. So will all you guys, right? So uh, we went in there, and we started – we bought billboards, freeway billboards, not the little dinky billboards, the big freeway billboards. And – uh. And we put the, we went uh, three months out before the team was going to go on the ice. We put just eyeballs on the billboard, two big eyes on the billboard, uh, on these freeway billboards. Bought them on all the freeways in Nashville, okay, and two eyeballs. And uh, 
and left it that way for two weeks. I talked to the Lamar advertiser and told them my 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 my, my plan, and uh, they went, God, Ron, nobody's ever done it this way. They go, we got to see what this is going to do, man. This, so I said, uh, uh, so uh, two eyeballs there for two weeks. Two weeks later, all of a sudden, there's a mask around a hockey mask around the eyeballs. Eyeballs are still the thing that stick out to them, but there's a mask there. And they're like, and I can, we don't say nothing. You know, I'm not talking to the paper or anything else. I'm just pumping them, uh, pumping these freeways, man, getting everybody's attention out there. Uh, about uh, two weeks after that, all of a sudden, we the team's name was the Knights. Well, the, the iron, it's an iron mask, uh, like a knight would wear but the eyeballs are sticking out of it so that you can really see the eyes. And along come the hockey sticks that not just come out behind it, but they extend 20 feet at the top of the freeway wow. built course. So that now, now they go, now people are going, whoa, what is that? That's hockey, hockey coming. Then, then we, nothing's there. Two weeks later, the date, boom, it's coming. And uh, that's, and we did all these. We we went to banks. We did stuff, Gerald. Uh, to, we went to banks and uh, radio stations. We we set up nights with radios. This is going to be your night. Uh, what do you want to do with your night? Uh, how you want to promote it? How, what are you going to do to fill that arena so you can be a big star and so we can be a big star? I'll tell you one of the promotions right off the bat. We went to the biggest station in town, and uh, he wasn't a star at this point. And we almost thought, we thought it was going to bomb but we asked them what do you want to do and they said uh we want to have a a, a, a a contest on ice uh for a guy that's not even a, he's not a big star right now but you're going to know who he is he goes we want to have a garth brooks look like contest on ice and uh but now listen we didn't know who garth we'd never heard of <laughs> and they told us they said no you don't know who he is but you're going to He's got a song coming out. And uh, so we we left there disappointed. What kind of show? Who's Garth Brooks? This ain't going you know? to happen. Two or three weeks later, we're riding home from Nashville to Knoxville because we had to go back and forth all the time. And the radio said, radio jockey goes, boy, you listen to this one. You're going to like this one. And bang, this guy's name is Garth Brooks. And here comes that we got friends and low. <laughs> I worked at Bobby. I was like, wow, Bobby. We <laughs> and not only did we have the lookalike contest, we had Garth Brooks on the ice. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I kept hawking. I said, get me Garth Brooks. Get me Garth Brooks. We got to have Garth Brooks be the judge. So Garth came and, ju and judged the contest. Then he went and signed all the he started signing autographs as soon as he judged the contest. First period, he signed autographs through the entire rest of the night. The Coliseum was lined up five deep all the way around it, right? And uh, and I went to him in the third period, and uh, and we got to be close friends. We got to be very close friends. In fact, he came to, he came to Cincinnati for me. But uh, uh, we uh, he was signing, and I went to him in the third period, and I said, Gar. I said, you don't have to sign all these autographs. I mean, you've done enough, man. You've been great. Wow, you can't do it. And he looked at me and he said, Ron, he goes, I'm not leaving until I sign every Wow. Damn. You know, and, and I turned to Bob, who was standing to him, and I, I said, Bobby, he's going to be a star. Big time. <laughs> and uh, by golly, I guess he did. Right? Yeah, I guess we so. Did, yeah. We did all these things. So we did all these different Promotions that had never been done on ice anywhere. I mean, you know, they didn't do it in the NHL. They didn't do it in the East Coast. They had never done this. Before. They didn't know what we were going to do. And uh, so then I said, we got to have a game intro. I mean, I said, I mean, we don't send these people out there to a dead damn house, man, and they're all set on their hands. I said, we're going to do an intro. And uh, so I had a great little announcer, man. He's all fired up. God, what are we going to do, Ron? What are we going to do? And, uh, you know, so I started explaining it to him. And uh, so the first night, the first night we did the show, we got ready to open the game. We had to hold the game because we had so many people outside. Wow. Uh, first night, they said, uh, you know, we went back to the next morning. 
after this. No, I I took and I had another press conference after the first game. <laughs> took the newspaper, the front page of the sports had the a whole top half of the page was six thousand and four. Wow. That was the attendance, right? And uh, and I I just said, guys, remember six months ago when uh, we were bombed and dead, and not going to drop five hundred. Here's the number. Uh, and uh, you know, so I got my, I got my, my, got back at him. So first game, we held up the game, and then when the game started, uh, the other team, uh, the other team uh, uh, coach came to me and he says, "We we're late starting. We we can't start the game late." You know, I said, "Man, we we got a thousand people outside." I said, "They're going to see something here in a few minutes. I don't want to miss." And I said, "I don't care." And they're going to – all the masses are going to be in this building before you get the boys out on the ice. And uh, so, you know, well, he's a wrestler. You know, that's back to the wrestler. He, don't mess with him. He's a wrestler, right? So, uh, they he tucked his tail and he ran back in the <laughs> dressing room. And uh, so, so when we got them all in there, when we got ready, we t- killed the lights. The whole building went dark. Everybody in the building probably thought, Oh God! The electrical, the lights have gone. <laughs> they had to pay the bill. <laughs> and then we, and then we started the dunna dunna, the dunna dunna, the old, the old, uh, oh man, uh, George Thurgood. Yeah, George Thurgood, man. I mean, uh, it was a Bob Armstrong song, <laughs> man. That he came to the ring with, and and then we cut the spotlights on, man. And then uh, all of a sudden. The announcer said, ladies and gentlemen, here come you. We're so proud to present to you your Nashville Knights, right? And uh, and then the the other team's out there skating around. They already went out and they're skating around, ready for the game to start. They lined up on the on the red line. They stopped warming up. They just like, what is what's going on? The and the coach, I see him over there, he's like, what in the hell is what are they doing? And uh and then the you know then the players started coming in, and the 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 guy introduced my announcer introduced every one of them. Never been done in hockey before, and you never hear the player's name. You don't get that type of introduction. And uh, they came on the ice one at a time. And here's a rocket Bouchard, and they had all these nicknames. And, and every the more players that came on, the louder the damn crowd got. They were all standing up, and uh, the last guy came through onto the ice. And he took his stick and he flipped it over his shoulder like a gun. And he dropped down on his knees and he mowed down the whole other team that was standing out of the red line. <laughs> that building exploded. I mean, did, was- did you arrange that or did this guy just have lived that? Huh? Did you arrange that or did Oh, no, I just took the boys out a day early, man. I said, here's your. <laughs> I wasn't going to take no chance, man. And I got the dude that could skate and could scoot it out there and, and on his knees and get all the way across the ice. He slid on his knees all the way across the ice, and he gunned down that whole team, man. It was like – it was made. Hockey was made. I mean, uh, we took uh, – franchise went from 25000 The next year, we went and bought one in Cincinnati. They said – and we went to the team meeting uh, – to the meeting at the end of the year – we drew the largest crowds they'd ever had. We drew 8,000 plus. We wow. sold out the building twice in that first year. Wow. And uh, and uh, then we uh, went back, went to those meetings in the summer and we sat down and they were got, everybody's like, Ron, you know, well, wow. I mean, what in the hell do you do over there? <laughs> Gee, how did you how did you fill the building? And uh, and you know normally those guys were making about uh, seventy five thousand dollars a year off of selling their dasher boards. Well, hell, dashers was just a start for us, man. We had all these packages and all these things. We sold three hundred thousand dollars worth of of other revenue to, to uh, the advertising revenue. Be a part of the team, right? Yeah. And, and that went to a million a year later in Cincinnati. Wow. Just the revenue from the sales of being a part of the company. So we went, sat down in the meeting. We sat through the whole meeting. Everybody was just, uh, Ron, can we do openings? Do you have a problem if we do an opening? I said, no, guys, do your deal, man. Let's entertain them. You know, you got to entertain them. And uh, 
I had a, the first game. I had the guys from the NHL, two major guys from the NHL, and uh, they came into the office after the first period. They watched the intro and the whole deal, and uh, and then my announcer he was saying uh, that I had a goalie named John Reed, and when John Reed would make a save. Uh, he'd go, saved by John Reed. And uh, the whole crowd by the end of the game is going, Reed. I mean, everybody's into it. They come in my office and they go, who owns this? Who owns this? I hear them out on in the, in the outside. Who owns this company? And, and I said, I own it. I'm back here. You know? And, uh, so they, they, I said, who are you? I introduced myself. Who are you? I'm from the Black Hawks. And I'm from the soldier. You know? uh, and, uh, so I said, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they said, uh, who in the hell do you think you are? And I said, what do you mean, man? I mean, no, we did. You, you, that ain't hockey. They go, that ain't hockey. What you did the night out there. They go, that ain't hockey. Wow. They go, well, yeah, they, they, they go, that, you, you think, you're not going to do that That's every wrestling. <laughs> yeah, he said, you're not going to do that every game, are you? And I said, you damn right, I'm gonna do it, every, <laughs> you know. And they said, they said, uh, they, yeah, this this is just not hockey. And I, and I told them, I said, guys, listen, I said we're in Nashville, Tennessee. I said we're not in Minnesota, we're not in Canada. I said half these people that are no seats out there uh, don't know a damn thing about this game. I said, but I will tell you what, how many was standing up? How many was in the seat? when that game started, you know? And I said, I bet the two of you would stand up, would you? And they looked at each other like, damn, he got us, you know? I mean, you know, uh, they had gotten into it themselves. And I said, I be, I said, I own this team. And I said, it may be in the minor leagues, but I'm going to draw major league crowds. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to entertain these people until they learn the game. And I said, once they learn the game, I won't have to do it, but I'm still going to do it. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a little little wager with you right now before you two guys leave here that it will be two years or three years that you'll be doing the same damn thing. <laughs> and by God, it was. It wasn't much longer than that. It'll happen. It actually happened the next year with uh, Chicago, with the Bulls. And they had somebody at that game watch that intro, and they got the idea for doing their intro. So I came. I kind of started that whole deal of introducing sports teams indoors. Wow! You know, wow. I did it with the hockey team. That's. I'm, I heard that story. That is just amazing to me. You know, and what gets me about this is, you know, the old uh, purist about sports say you don't need that stuff. You don't need the pyro. You don't need the pyro. But the Chicago Bulls that you just mentioned. When they had Jordan, arguably the greatest team of all time, arguably the greatest player. You didn't argue that, but one of. They still did all of that around it to give yeah. people the entertainment to go with it. doesn't detract yeah. from the sport. It just adds to it. It it was a, it was an absolute necessity in a minor league hockey operation, in my opinion. You know, I mean, I realized after watching how the game started and how – planned and nothing happening i said we gotta we gotta pump it up we gotta do something that gets them right off the bat we went to this so we went to this team meeting in the middle of the summer and they they got to the last meeting and they said is there anything else anybody would like to bring up and uh and i raised my hand and they said uh, okay ron uh, what's the deal and then uh, i said uh we'd like to have a second team and they were like what i mean you Two team, you two, two on, on two teams in the same league, and I said, "Yeah." And I said, uh, "We're not going to embarrass you guys. We're going to draw bigger crowds. We want, we want to go to." It. They said, "Where you want to go?" I said, "Cincinnati." They were like, "Oh my God, Cincinnati! That's a big city, Ron." I go, "You're damn right it is. <laughs> nice building, Cincinnati Gardens, hold ten thousand, and it's an exact replica of Montreal Arena." I said, ten thousand. 10,000 guys, 10,000. Uh, let that number stick in your craw. And uh, they, I said, they all looked at each other. Well, you could cheat. I mean, if you got two teams, you could have your one team lose to another if you got the playoff. <laughs> I said, guys, 10,000 seats, 10,000 seats. I just kept hammering the 10,000 seats, 10,000 fans, you know. And then uh, finally they said, uh, okay. They all had a little vote. Okay. 
we'll let you have a second team. But then next year, you got to sell one of your teams. And I said, no problem, no problem. Because I figured Cincinnati's good. I'll, pick, I'll sell my worst team, All right? No big deal. And uh, we went to Cincinnati, got the same thing in Cincinnati. Minor league hockey? Oh, geez, yeah, no way. It ain't going to happen. No, no. I said, wait a minute now. You know, uh, we draw uh, 6,000 a game, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, you 6,000 a game in Nashville, Tennessee for minor league hockey? You know, and so uh, we uh, we get into Cincinnati. We drew 7,800 the first night, first game. Uh, second year, we sold out 30. We sold out 32 games, 10,200 average. Oh, wow. <laughs> Tire season. I mean, uh, you, that, you were out drawing most of the NHL then. We out drew four NHL teams. Wow. In, uh, in that second year. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I drew four NHL teams. And, uh, and we just kept doing that same deal. Uh, we just kept coming up with different intros, different things. I brought in the San Diego chicken. I mean, uh, we did it all, man. Uh, people got to see it. We did a promotion with the bank that we called uh, Dash for Cash. And we went to a bank and told them about what our deal was. And when we went in, they were like, oh, it's a minor league team. And, you know, we don't get hockey. Nobody's going to – what is no? I said, just listen to the idea. I said, here's what I want to do. And we'll have a DJ uh, uh, get your – get a people. We want you to uh, – We'll pick two people off your favorite radio station. Said you can pick the people, and uh, we're going to bring them down, uh, put uh, uniforms on that are full of pockets, and uh, we're going to take a hundred thousand dollars in cash, and we're going to spread it between the blue lines uh, in the middle of the ice, and we're going to send those people down at the end of the end of the building. We're going to put one minute on the clock, and we're going to let them run to that money and fill their pockets as much as they can and run back. We'll call it the $100,000 dash for catch. And uh, so I said, then they were like, well, I said, okay, and we're going to go a little further. I said, we're going to bring a Brinks truck. We're going to put the money in a Brinks truck. And when we get ready for your promotion, we're going to darken the building. We're going to turn on the lights, uh, turn on the spotlights, and we're going to play that cha-ching, that old song, cha-ching, cha-ching, the money song, right? And uh, and I said we're going to drive that, that we're going to drive that uh, truck, that bar- that Brinks truck, all the way around the ice, and then we're going to stop him in the middle of the ice. And I said we're going to open it up and have two guards in there with shotguns to get out have the shotguns to protect the money. And I said, then we're going to bring that money out and spread it, man. Let those people see it. And we're going to keep hollering your bank's name. And your bank's <laughs> going to get your bank. I kept your bank and your bank. I got $10,000 from that bank in, in about an hour. I spent an hour with them and they said, we want it. And, uh, and, and, they, and then they, once they watched it, they came and told me, they came to the office and they go, we want it forever. We want it. <laughs> wow. it's ours. This is our deal, right? So, yes. We went to the budget, rent a car. And, uh, and we had an idea. I said, let's, let's, let's figure out a way that we can let a fan, bring a fan in and let him try to uh, hit a puck through the, through the, there was a, there was a little template that you could buy in the hockey business, right? It was about that wide, you know, just a little wider than the puck. And you placed it at the bottom. I said, we'll put it at the bottom of an eight by 10 piece of plywood. We'll put budget rent a car on the plywood. We'll call it the budget rent a car shootout. And then we'll bring a person out of the crowd and select somebody. They'll come down and hit it. And I said, well, all we want you to do is to give away a Cadillac. This is a budget people. And they were like, Oh, do you know, wait a minute, the play Cadillac. I mean, this is a minor league team. You don't even know how many people you're going to draw, right? And I said, that, I said, the deal is you can get insurance for your Cadillac. If they make the shop, the most it can cost you is $1,500. I'd already done the damn research, right? And uh, they were like, wow, 1500 bucks. I said, guys, there's going to be a lot of asses in those seats that's coming here. I said, I've never seen nothing like this. That thing was spectacular, man. I mean, 
They were so happy. They came to me, the budget people. They said, Ron, we're going to do it. You're going to Cincinnati? We want to do it there, too. We want a budget deal up there, too. I said, we, they said, this is just unbelievable. So we came up with all this stuff. We took that little rinky-dink minor league hockey operation from four teams when we got there to eight teams the next year to 16 the next year. Within three years, it was a million dollars for the franchise. Wow. Went from 25000 to a million. And, uh, and it was because, by golly, we were. We were putting asses in their seat. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody had ever done that before. Wow. What a story. So what are you doing, Ron? What are you, I know you held you forever. Thank you. But what, what are you doing now that, uh, you know, you get your stud cast. What else? Oh, man, I, I have a stud cast uh, that I do weekly. I'm telling – I tell the whole story from my grandfather all the way through – I'm going to go all the way to the end of my wrestling career and maybe on into hockey if I need to. And, uh, you know, uh, I do, I have a, a YouTube channel. I got a YouTube channel, Southeastern Rewind. If you go to Southeastern Rewind, they can see uh, my stud cast for free. Uh, they get to, all kinds of other things that are on there. I have a streaming channel called Classic Continental Wrestling. Uh, it has a, uh, Right now, I have over 100 of my television shows from Southeastern to Continental to USA. And, uh, and I put them, rather than most, uh, most YouTube channels where they throw the wrestling TV shows on, they don't put them in order. They make no sense. And uh, you never get interested in them. These are in the exact order in which they were released. So the storylines, just like going like, like you were selling them, on a television show to begin with, they they get interested in the storyline. They know what they look for the next episode because God knows what's going to happen in that. Uh, you know, because that's what wrestling was basically is an athletic soap opera, right? I mean, if you did it right and you had the angles and uh, and and, and you uh, promoted it properly, you're going to do good. So I've got that uh, classiccarnell.com at streaming channel four ninety nine a month, twenty nine ninety nine for a year. Uh, it's got it's loaded with not only that I have 20 I have 43 super stud casts on there that are two to three hours long uh, we talked about one of them today is with uh, with Bill <laughs> with Bill Bill did one for me uh, it's with uh, uh, Terry Funk and Stan Hansen uh, uh, just about every great star of mankind uh, uh, God it, 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 more than I more than I could, more than I could uh, come up with and uh, tell everybody. Bob Armstrong is just about everybody. Andre the Giant, all of my Andre stories from uh, spending years with Andre, Andre on the road, having him come through the territory. Uh, uh, it's got all the history of all the all the NWA stars that I ever wrestled, and uh, my assessment of their talents. And uh, it's got uh, uh, superstars in it, uh, stars of the sport. Uh, it's got uh, uh, stars of the past. I go back and do a wrestling history, starting with the the very first legends of wrestling, and start out with uh, actually with Abraham Lincoln, who was a great wrestler. You know, uh, goes to, goes uh, from there to uh, Farmer Burns. Uh, uh, just a, uh, it's a. Uh, I got I got a little bit of everything on there, and uh, all kinds of stuff uh, that. Uh, that uh, it's it's uh, old school. It's a real old school paradise, man. If you're old school, uh, all those shows goes back to '78, as far as '78, and uh, and uh, and all the way through to uh, programs in '87. And I also have a book. I also have a book that I've written too, uh, which I is think uh, Mr. Briscoe has it right there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, and. Uh, and, you know, when, once I retired and I got out of everything, I thought I was out of everything. I had myself a dream one night, and uh, I dreamed about a line, and I got up the next morning, and I said, I got to write a book. And uh, so, and the book does pretty darn good, too. Uh, well, uh, uh, got the, I'm, my, my ratings are uh, 4.5 on that book. On Somebody never wrote a book in his life, and uh, – and, and a lot of the people that uh, 
do the no one knowing you, somebody had never read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to say. It just, that's just mean. That's just mean. <laughs> well, I, I've known the Fuller for 50 years. So. I don't read a lot of books, I'll tell you that. But uh, people that review it say, a lot of people say it's the next Jaws. So, uh, you know, it's a, uh, so uh, I got I got a lot going on, Gerald. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty busy, John. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, this has been about the best two and a half hours I've spent in years. I have enjoyed this so much. I could talk to you for two weeks. So I can't thank you enough for taking the time out to, to, to join us. Well, thank you very much, John. It's my pleasure, man. Uh, I got a whole lot of other stories. And I got a lot of people that uh, that come back and they I do a t- podcast and they go, wow. And they go, how about next time? And, uh, and then how about next time? And how about next time? I mean, uh, no, I don't. You know, well, how about it next time, Ron? And we'll get into we'll really get into some of your angles, which were uh, yes ahead of their time. You know, with the deal with the Armstrongs. I mean, wow, you guys had a little territory. You guys had set the nation on fire with that little territory. So, yeah, I got, and I've got about twenty questions I didn't ask about Andre, <laughs> about Bob Armstrong. I had so many. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe we we can get together or do a do a uh, episode two of this thing, and it, it was so enjoyable having on. I've known you forever, and you, you've been a great friend forever, man. I really appreciate our friendship, and man, thanks so much for coming on here and spending your afternoon with us. And uh, and man, nothing but the best to you. Oh, thank y'all very much. I, it's my pleasure. I enjoyed it, and uh, if you want to do another one? Just give me a call. Mm-hmm.